Ducks Don't Get Cold Feet, podcast number 29, and I am here with Michael Mojo Johnson. Michael, mindset performance coach. Is that what best describes you? I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out for a long time. And uh, <laughs> I I don't know. Everyone always asks me, you know, what do you do? And, and that's the thing that I, I think I do best is help people perform better. Um, as far as mindset, motivation, I get called all different types of things. Normally a lot of profanities as well along the way. But um, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think... Um, yeah, my thing is just helping people perform better and I use a lot of different human performance tools from anything to do with health to mindset, um, psychology, neuroscience, and then I just bridge the gap between all of those um, to help people kick ass. I, f I think that uh, there's a, a bunch of people in society that have a burning desire to be better and wake up every day and ask themselves, you know, am I doing enough? And, and um, I love working with those groups of people. Um, I don't think my spot's out in the world helping everybody. It's just helping those groups of people um, I find that the, the people who tend to push hardest in society don't get a lot of support. Um, and those who tend to be fairly driven and achieve a lot don't tend to get a lot of support. Yep. They tend to cop a lot of shit, but they don't get a lot of support. Um, but they're the ones who tend to inspire everyone else to step up as well. So, you know, I think, um, you know, I thought about this years and years ago and I thought, how do I help the world be more inspired? And it's to help those who inspire others the most. And that tends to be, you know, business owners, entrepreneurs, professional athletes, um, and just people who want to kick ass in life, you know. So if if we if we grab that and we go back to where it all began, mm -hmm. you were born in South Australia. I was born in South Australia. Yeah, Parafield Gardens. Parafield Gardens. Okay, one of my mates, uh, Kim Ashworth, you there? Still in Parra Hills. I spent a lot of time in Parafield. Yeah, it was uh, Parafield. The Par very close Parra Hills. We've got a supermarket there as well. Nice. So I I. I, to me, what, what, to me, when did you start, you know, what school did you go to? Did you, when did you, what happened? You've had oh. a bit of a checkered uh, early career, so oh, I've seen. Long, long story, but um, mum had me when she was 17, a Catholic family. Dad is the most bogan atheist, you know, that you can probably find. I think, uh, you know, if, if he, his form of active wear is a bintang shirt and um, SNFL Port Magpies footy shorts. Um, <laughs> And you know those those flip flops, flops or those thongs that are like water skis that are that are thick and chunky. You know he's stoked now that the mullets come back in fashion. Um, you know um, he's going to be like the coolest dude around. But um, yeah, that was my dad. That was my mum. And um, growing up, it was just an interesting dynamic. Uh, dad was pretty chilled out and relaxed. Um, you know, we said that you just got to make the most of every day, and he just made the most of it. Just pretty relaxed and chilled out. And um, mum, was it your dad working? Yeah, yeah. So dad always worked two jobs. He was, I think that's where I get my work ethic from. He he just worked as hard as what he could. He um he'd work daytime and then go to night like a night job as well. Um, it obviously didn't love his wife. Yeah, maybe I don't know. <laughs> mum was pretty hardcore when she was young. <laughs> Sorry, um, mum. <laughs> yeah. If if you're listening to this, we'll, de we'll delete that part. Oh, I'll, Sorry, I'll, I'll buy you a, a, a better birthday gift. Um, <clears throat> but um. Yeah, dad always worked hard and, um, you know, mum had some brothers and sisters and they went to university and she dropped out of school uh, to to work at John Martin's. Um, she was a shoe clerk. Yep. Um, and I think there was a lot of pressure in the house for me to perform and for me to, to do well at school. Um, I think that was the missingness that she had in her life. And this is the thing that fascinated me about human behaviour as well was like, you know, why do different people do what they do? But I know in my family, I think I was driven from my dad's work ethic, but I think a lot of the drive and a lot of the aggression uh, that I had to want to be something came from my mum. And I think that was just because she had to drop out of school and put a lot of pressure on me to do well at school. But pretty quickly I learned at school, the things that I enjoyed weren't the things that made me do well at school, which was hanging out with people, socializing, <laughs> causing shit, um, <laughs> fighting. So, um, they, they weren't things that you tend to do well at school. So um, you, you, I'm assuming at <clears throat> school, you know, were you the bully or were you bullied? Uh, I was a bit of both. I think um, my first, because I went back and, and- What school did you? I first started off at Holy Family in Parafield Gardens, and then we moved to Woodville, and then I went to Woodville Primary, and then across to Blackfriars, got expelled from Blackfriars, and then went to St. Michael's. What did you get expelled for? Fighting. So you're a badass. Uh, well, that nose isn't isn't broken Fuck, for no is, reason. Is, is so it, is it it's looks sort of straight. You've had some work on that. No, I haven't. No, it hasn't been broken back yet, but it's still blocked on one side. I've been I've been waiting to go back and actually get it broken. I just 
because I speak like now, you know, being a professional teacher and, and a speaker and, you know, I'm, yeah, it I'm is thinking. fucking crooked. It's Actually, definitely crooked. No, I didn't and know. My poor, I didn't, my poor son and ears weren't there just because <laughs> I sort of chose to blow 10 grand. Like, it's they, they were a legitimate thing. I kept, every time I ate pizza, I'd get to the crust, like the best part of the pizza, and I'd go to eat the crust and my teeth would snap off. Um, so I had to go get them done. Here, my tooth's chipped. Yeah. All right, now. And then oh my God. That, there's, that scar there was from being bottled in a nightclub. So, so I was a bit, if you bit go, stupid so when I was younger. You know, I, I got it on good authority that you ran away from home when you, when you were nine. Uh, I did run away from home when I was young. <laughs> that's that's uh, That was a nice bit of work. Um, yeah, I did run away from home. Um, yeah, I just... My mum... I was always in trouble at school, so I felt like I was in trouble at home and I was in trouble at school. I um, The thing that I loved doing was BMX racing and... When I would get home from school, I had a friend who lived across the road, Rocco, and we were both into BMX riding and, and racing. And um, we did you have a stop? Did you have a mongoose? I didn't have a mongoose. I had a red line. Red line. So I had a, a oh. wireframe red line, and yeah. So we used to we used to race at Cross Keys, and that was like our thing every Wednesday night. We'd go to Cross Keys and and race our BMX bikes. Um, and so that's what I really enjoy doing. And then you know I was always in shit at home. And um, this one day I remember Mum was just. I, I can't remember what she was giving me shit about and I thought, fuck it. So I just, I think I just packed a, a bag at nine years of age and rode down Salisbury Highway and uh, well, onto Port Wakefield Road onto Salisbury Highway before the expressway was there and ended up riding to my grandparents' house at Woodville. So yeah, it was about a 35 or 40 minute Not bike ride as a nine-year-old. Not the first kid to do something like that. Yeah. So yeah, I did, I did do that. So um, schooling, like you're talking about fights at school. I mean, I'm now seeing my kids... I'm seeing some interesting stuff happen at school. Mm. And I, I, to be honest, it concerns me this sort of bullying. that that's It is bullying that I'm seeing. And I was like, I, I went back to when I was at school and we didn't have any of this shit. Like it was, you know, it was as is. Um, maybe with the boys, all boys, you sort of know exactly where you stand. Mm. But the shit that's going on where, where my daughters are at, I don't know. I'm not 100% convinced that's what I want for my kids moving forward. Mm. And and I've been saying you got to protect yourself. You got to defend yourself. You actually got to speak up and if you don't like what's being said, say your piece. Mm. And I never thought I'd be saying that. Mm. I I didn't. And now I look into it. I I can see you have to be quite strong even from a young age. Mm. I'm I'm talking year 1, year 2 here. And, yeah, it makes me really look at things a little bit different. I, I don't know whether it's because I've got kids now, um, but it's definitely, I look at it, it's, it really m makes me think about, is this the right place that I want my kids to be brought up with? Or is this just what happens everywhere? You just need to put your line, you, you know, draw the line of where you're going to, what you're going to defend. Mm. So for you, it sounded like you're defending it the whole time. Well, I think I was just different. Um, you know, having young young parents, um, they also had a shack up in the Riverland as well. So I grew up wakeboarding, riding motorbikes. Um, my dad and his best friend, who was the Australian Junior Rally Champion, bought a block of land and we had bobcats and graders and we um, we had racetracks on there. And so I grew up racing rally cars um, and I was part of a, a rally team as well. And so almost every weekend, I wasn't with the kids playing football and soccer and or netball or whatever whatever was going on at school. I was up in the Riverland doing cool shit yeah. or what I thought was cool shit. But it made it really hard to fit in because I wasn't the intelligent kid. I wasn't part of a, a sports team or whatever. So I just, I think I wanted to fit in, um, but just didn't really have a place. And I remember the majority of my childhood, I'd sit at home on school holidays and either paint model airplanes, watch movies like comedies and stuff like that like beverly hills cop oh, or mate. police academy or oh, you know wayne's world mate, mate. so um you know I'd, I'd do a lot of that sort of stuff and i was really inquisitive i used to watch a lot of documentaries um but i just never really i would never really fit in so i did get picked on quite a bit i had bright red hair freckles i was a chubby kid as well that um, red yeah, it's still got. It's, I mean, it's dark now, but is that give is it a, that dark? If we if we got color in our hair, we definitely don't have color. It's. I just came from massage, so it's probably massage oil, and <laughs> <laughs> there's probably a whole bunch of shit in there. Um, 
<laughs> but yeah, it's um, it definitely goes a little bit darker in winter, but in summer, in the in the light, it starts lightening up a little bit. So that's true. Yeah. You get a bit of shit because you got red hair. You definitely get a, a lot of shit having red hair. Um, that's was, the thing. One hundred percent, it is. You know, I was I was always told redheads are fiery, but I think it is because you got to you got to defend yourself. And um, yeah, I think from from a young age, I remember being at school and being picked on really young and I used to cry, but then yeah, I just got picked on more. So I just learned how if you beat the shit out of the kid who picks on you, after a while you get left alone. And that was like my strategy all through school. Um, so yeah, I just learned how to fight. All through school or when, when did it start? Because I, you know, you're clearly, you, you've got parents that are working their guts out. Yep. Um, you're going to school, you're getting in a bit of trouble. You're, you're academically, you know, you had a bit of ADD. I'm, a sh- I mean, I'm back in my oh, day. No one, 100%. no one, like, was never, no one ever talked about that when I was at school. It's just, you're just a bit different. I still get that now. And, it's, you know, I'm perfectly fine. I, I have a, in, my, in my words. <laughs> my team says I'm off tap, but I, I don't know if I'm off tap. I just have an, an, the tap's either on or it's off. I'm either resting and asleep or I'm like flat out and going. Full I, bore. I think I can, uh, I can understand that totally, mm. uh, and I do. Under, I definitely understand that and what you're saying. So, at school, anything that you wanted to be or do? Was there there's something that that sort of stood out? Yeah, there was a lot. Um, because I di- I had a fascination with cars. I I love figuring out how things work, and I still have that fascination. Um, so at school, I think I wanted to grow up and be a rally champion, um, having raced rally cars with the so Australian Junior Rally Champion. Any um, Is there any driver that you can look back at now that changed your life? Yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to be part of the Australian Junior Rally cha- um, Championship as well. So we used to travel quite a lot. And I was able to meet uh, Possum Bourne, who's now passed away. But, um, you know, the original, uh, I think the Subaru Rally Champion. Um, cool. Yeah, watching him race was just unbelievable um, and getting to meet him. And I remember going into his transporter and stuff like that and, and seeing how he'd travel around. It was absolutely phenomenal. Um, so, yeah, that I think that was something that I sort of aspired to be. I also loved water. Um, I grew up wakeboarding and water skiing and all those sort of things as well. I know you are you grew up on the river as well. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, I think some, I of, some of your friends up there are – Close to or, or know a lot of my mates as well um, that I grew up wakeboarding with. I love it. Um, so different world. Yeah. So love that. Um, so just on a rally driving, mm. it's fair to say most rally drivers have a few screws loose. Mm. Did there anyone in the world seen take your imagination? Yeah, I grew up in the era of Colin McRae. And oh, there it is. I was, I was hoping you'd lead into that. Yeah, so... Um, Colin back, McRae. Yeah, back in the day, Colin McRae. Um, I'm just trying to remember all of the guys now, but um, it definitely oh, Colin Harry McRae. Vatton and Colin McRae. Yeah. I, I mean, Colin McRae was that when I saw him with a Subaru 555, I still have my 555 jacket that the cigarette company. I'm a Subaru tragic. There's no doubt about that. that that's... I'm almost saying it's my favourite car. Um, I must say, I looked at, I, I had a look only recently at buying a, I was I was just sitting there thinking one night, I was like, I wonder what 99 STIs are going for. And I had a look and I went, fucking hell, jeez. I wish I would have bought one years ago. But um, yeah, they, they're they very special. And, mm. and not to mention a 22B, not to mention that someone in Adelaide is sitting on two of them. Oh. And they don't want to sell them. But <laughs> if you look at Colin McRae and what someone did, so I, I was never into rally driving, but I've got my whole bunch of things out the back here and going through all the Colin McRae things and, like, they were all rally videos. So VH, they weren't Peter, but VHS videos, World Rally Championship, Colin McRae, WRX. So because of him, I bought a WRX. Yeah. So for me, my... Present for myself for my 30th birthday was a WRX. Oh. And, it, and in fact, it was a 99 four door WRX. Does that, I don't know if those years add up, but yeah, 99 four door uh, WRX. And it was one of the first WRXs in South Australia. Oh. All because of Colin McRae. Is it blue? Yeah, blue. Oh, yeah. Mate, it was like my wall was covered 
and I had that car. Yeah. So that's why I got a friend of mine who we've had a few interesting words with, but I believe he's one of the amazing drivers, um, rally drivers, Steve Glennie, and he he's amazing. But mm. like everything in life, it comes down to right time, right place, mm. timing. And I think his timing's been out, not because he can't drive. I think he's unbelievable. But, yeah, we've had a few. I think we're talking now, but we had a few <laughs> few words. But that's cool. That's what happens in life, everyone. I think in sport that's something that's really important. Like I, I actually watched that growing up as a kid. I was part of different race teams, even in drag racing and things like that because um, uh, my dad builds – he still builds custom cars for a hobby, so he builds like crazy weird shit. Uh, or I shouldn't say weird, but it's definitely different. Um, and watching the people who made it versus the people who didn't, it could just be a matter of timing. That's all it is. Uh, and it's fair to say life is about timing. Mm. So uh, before I talk about timing, because I'm <laughs> going to make a note of that because it's one of the biggest, I think it's the biggest thing in life, to be honest. Oops, put it in the wrong book. Um, you talked about being, you know, were you driving or were you navigating or were you doing a bit of both? No, well, we had the the racetrack and I just, I, I hadn't even got my license yet. So I started driving with Dave, who was the South Australian Junior Rally Champion, David Hall, um, in, in the passenger seat. Um, and so, yeah, I just learned how to drive from a really young age and I guess I was quite good at it. And about two weeks after getting my P's, there was a my parents had a shack at Punny LaRue in between Walker's Flat and Swan Reach. Yep. Um, and there was this amazing T-junction with a huge camber uh, on this it. And good. my dad used to have a, an R31 Skyline. Huh. And he would, even as a 14-year-old kid, he'd flip me the keys and just say, go out and get firewood. So I'd load the boys up in the back of the car and, you know, would I'd be sideways in the trail. You'd watch the trailer almost come past the car as you're sideways <laughs> around the corner and all the wood just goes flying off. Like, well, I used to run amok in that car. Um, and so I guess I was pretty lucky growing up in that environment. But um, two weeks after I got my P's, you know, when I when I turned 16, the day I turned 16, I went and got my L's. And the day I turned 16 and a half, I was the first person at Motor Reg that morning to go get my P or to, to finalize my P's. Um, and driving was like the most amazing thing for me. It was, I, I think I'd waited my whole life for that. Had the car for two weeks, took it up to the river, had two friends in the car, came around the corner set up the perfect the perfect power slide into the corner um use a handbrake th threw it into the corner hit the camber just power slid out next second we're on the side flipped the car got out the car everyone was okay and a truck had got bogged a couple of days beforehand on the dirt road and left these two big indents and the back tire just clipped it and just flipped it straight up on the side and i bought that car when i was i think about 14 and a half and spent a year and a half doing it up so that i could have it and gone. then um yeah it was gone and i remember my dad what saying was it? Uh, it was a Datsun Bluebird. Oh, what five fifty? No, couldn't be. No, it was. Uh, it wasn't like the like one twenty white. No, no, it was. It was an eighty three Bluebird. They're like a square boxy yeah, looking square thing, almost boxing like a looking stanza. One. Like the five fifty. Now, see if you look at that truck there in the middle with the green thing, right? See the trolleys. Yep. Go down, and there's a white one. It's it's not a Bluebird, but it's exactly what it looks like. Yep. Yeah, there's yeah. plenty of white ones there. Yeah. So, yeah. They're um, cool cars, like a stanza. Yes, yeah. Ah, yeah, got it. And I remember, I remember someone pulling up and they said, like, where do you want to go? And I remember we were driving back to the shack and the the shack where Dave, the rally driver, was, his parents both used to race as well. So, he, um, his dad, Peter Hall, was like a road racing champion and had heaps of different trophies. His mum, I think, was at the time still the fastest woman around Malala. So, his whole family were just into racing. And I remember rocking up there. I just got out of the car and I said, like, I've crashed the car. And we all hopped in one of the four drives and went out there. And I remember Dave's dad, um, Peter, just saying to me, oh, well, now you learn you learn a valuable lesson about driving. And then I remember my dad getting out and, and my mum was freaking out at the time because I think, you know, she thought I was going to die or whatever the fuck happened. And I did have blood on my arm from where the window smashed in. And But um, dad said to me, well, looks like you're catching the bus now. And I was like, fuck. There it so goes. I learned the most valuable lesson, which is don't fuck around too much in your road car, because if you do that, you've got to catch the bus. <laughs> that's, a, so. that's a bloody good lesson to learn, because sometimes you don't realise these things until they're gone. Yep. But rally driving, pretty crazy. Mm. You get through school just by the sounds of it. Um, I thought you wanted to study marine biology. I did. So I, w I got went... 
I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I was sort of good at biology. There were some subjects that I was really good at and one of them was geography, one of them was biology, uh, mechanics was another one. Um, I was just really inquisitive. So any subjects that I could that I could learn things from that I could use in a practical way were always subjects that I excelled at. So the things that I weren't, I wasn't the best at was like physics, mathematics, although now I know there's a lot of use for those things. I just didn't see it when I was younger. Um, English, I'm still probably not the best at that, um, even though I do write a lot. Thank God for spell check. Yeah. Um, to all the teachers that said, you know, you, you're going to have to carry around a dictionary if you don't learn how to spell. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah, things have changed. Yeah. Certain things, things have changed, changed. definitely. Like, this, this kid here, you ask him something, it's like, you know, here I am going, Ollie, how do you do this? And like, he's literally just Googling it and comes back with an answer. Like, yep. he's really smart. And he's like, you're such a boomer. I'm like, oh, you do it all the time. True story. Don't you? Well, Google's one hell of a tool. Yeah. <laughs> See? All the time. But it's right. I'm, yeah. I'm not the best speller. Like, but... I know I'm in trouble when spell check doesn't pick it up. Yeah. I'm like, Damn, I've got to use a different word. Like it's lost. So it's fair enough. And times change. So is schooling, mm. but I don't know if it's changed enough. I don't think it has. But yeah, so um, I was I was at school and um, my grandparents uh, also love fishing and things like that. And I love being around water. So I thought maybe marine biology is the thing. Ended up hooking up some work experience up at Port Lincoln. And it was the worst fucking week of my life. I drove for... I don't know what seemed like an eternity to get there, yeah. got there. And then I spent seven days with my arms, you know, elbow deep in, in fucking tanks of water in the middle of winter. It's blowing a gale. It's oh. fucking freezing. I think it was like, you know, two or three degrees, pissing down with rain. And there I am, you know, cleaning abalone tanks and shit like that. And then I just, I would shiver for, I don't know, three or four hours, just get warm. Then it's bedtime, go to bed, wake up, go back to work at 5.30 in the morning arms in tanks of water and I thought fuck this I don't want to be a marine biologist anymore so that was pretty so easy. that was it yeah that was done um then I watched Top Gun thought I'd be a fighter pilot then I realized you got to be good at mathematics that wasn't my thing <laughs> it helps it does help so so what happened at age 15 for you 15 was pretty crazy so that was where I got expelled from school um and it was just I I, I didn't really fit into a group and I was with some pretty rough kids at the time and I remember being bullied by this one kid and he'd he had sort of threatened me pretty pretty clearly and um yeah i ended up just beating the shit out of him on the on the oval and got expelled from school um and i remember just the disappointment black fries yeah well it's pretty interesting on black fires you know they're producing pretty interesting statues they definitely produce some very interesting statues <laughs> like so to get expelled like far out i think that was before I, I was before the statue. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. Right. Yeah. So, so <laughs> your, your parents get told, like, you know, they they've they must have saved their pennies to send you to a private. Is they that did. a private school? Yeah. Private school? Yeah. So, what happened next? Well, my my mum's brothers both went to Blackfriars as well. So they were sort of, I don't know. There was this thing in the family of like Blackfriars was a school, and um, yeah, when I got expelled, I just thought. No, I'm in trouble at home, in trouble at school all the time. Maybe that's it. Like, maybe I'm just not meant to be here anymore. And that was where, you know, I was pretty much ready to take my own life. And I just remember sitting there one night with a massive sharp kitchen knife when everyone went to bed. And I just thought, that's it. Like, I'm just going to cut my wrist and that's it. Fucking done. I'm out of here. And then I remember just bawling my eyes out and, and I couldn't make sense of it all. And I just grabbed the kitchen knife and pegged it across the room. Like, I think this anger and rage just built up inside of me that I'd let other people determine and, and dictate my worth. Um, and yeah, I just threw the knife across the room and it cut part of the blinds and everything like that. And, and I just thought, you know, from this moment on, I'm never going to let another person determine my worth in this world. And I think it was probably the best, the best thing that I've ever learned about myself is that, you know, I don't really give a fuck what anyone else thinks about me. It's what I care about is what I think about me. Yeah. And I think, that's something that I teach consistently is that too many people get caught up, especially in this day and age. Like we're in the social media era where everyone has something to say. You know, I say it's red. Someone else says it's fucking green, even if it is red. Or if it's red, then someone else comes up and says, I think that it's fucking orange or burgundy or, you know, it's just, it's we're just in this stupid time at the moment where I don't know that the rules of social media have been defined by society. And so it's, everyone's just playing. Um, and then also when you've got the majority of, of those people as well being, young kids 
I, I was only thinking about this on TikTok the other day and just how feral TikTok is. I don't, I don't mind it, but it is just a platform of just absolute shit. Um, but it, it's because you're dealing with a group of people that are under the age of 30. Now, having studied quite a bit of neuroscience- Hang on, are you under 30? Me? Yeah, yeah bloody oath. I, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> um, no, um, I'm definitely over 30. But um, the, the prefrontal cortex or the frontal lobe doesn't really start to engage in males until their late 20s. And for females, it's their early 20s. So you're dealing with a bunch of people who can't think effectively to really understand the rules of engagement on social media, um, which can be a problem. I mean, you've got young people who are emotionally driven being told that you're fat, you're ugly, you're a piece of shit, you don't understand anything, having people just absolutely vicious online in their comment section. Um, and I think it can be quite damaging for a lot of younger people out there unless they're taught how to understand why people do that. I don't think I don't think the smart thing is to tell people not to do it. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. Yeah. The same as bullying is going to happen whether we like it or not. It's just how do you understand it? Why does it happen? And then how do you deal with it when it does happen? And I think that's that's somewhere that we've got to shift as a society instead of trying to control everything or ban everything or, you know, fucking create rules and shit and legalize yeah. or, you know, I, I don't I don't think that's the, the most intelligent way as, as a society. Well, half the ways in misconception, misconcepted anyway with what, what actually happens and what you actually see, <clears throat> the fact that we say it's freedom of choice, you're allowed to speak whatever your mind in Australia, you're allowed mm. to say what you want. Yeah. Twitter can take off the president of the United States <laughs> yeah. like, just because they don't like what, what he's saying. I mean, I, I don't think people are quite aware of mm. how much we get is actually controlled to a stage of, you know, you're only getting fed certain things that you're allowed to be fed. Yeah. It's not quite like China when you literally can't access all these other things. Mm. Um, I think it's a very scary place we live um and the doc have you seen the social dilemma i've seen parts of it yeah. yeah so that doco sort of summed up in a very simple way some of the scary shit that's going on and how kids are trying to make themselves look better we got a supplier actually that's about to has asked us to do a clip on how the social implement implementations that right implications of what t you know how people go to the extremes for a photo and um, yeah these these the girls in this specific example like they're 13 years old that are layering on makeup and, and like it's, it takes an hour to get a photo of a mm. selfie and i look at that and i think fuck that's what my kids this is all the shit they're going to see and it's quite frightening yeah, you can see it that way, but in our generation as well, um, I'm assuming you're a similar age to me or around about. Yeah. I'm, I turned 38, I think, in a couple of days. Yeah, close. I'll, I'll take I'll take that every yeah, day done. of the week. <laughs> okay, done. Um, so I guess we can add on plus or minus, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in our generation, models were bulimic and you, uh, you remember those photos of the skinny models and the fucking ribs and all that sort of shit? I think it's always been around like next, the next generation has always challenged society and whether it's through language or, you know, I, I grew up in an era where, you know, we had heavy metal, you know, rocking it out and then your hip hop came along as well. And it was challenging the way that society thinks and also the way that we use language and what was acceptable versus not acceptable. And I think every, every generation does that. We've got to move things forward. Um, and we also have to understand that maybe the things that we thought were wrong aren't really that wrong. Um, I'm sure hip hop freaked my parents out when they first heard it, yeah. heard it, but you know, a lot of the language and the wording that's used in that type of music is now just accepted as being the norm. Um, yeah. So um, I think there's always like those polarities in society of the extremes and that's never gonna change. And when you've got 13 year old girls, you know, putting on booty shorts and, and shit like that, I don't think, think it's that pretty it's normal. I don't think it's normal, but I don't we think don't it's. Have girls. I definitely In don't fact, have. Well, I'll put it smart, you don't have kids. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just. I'm <laughs> saying it's fucking frightening. Like it would be because because I I look at that and go oh like I can handle myself like these days I literally post and ghost some 
Yeah. I, I respond to positive comments or mm -hmm. interactions, but anyone that's, you know, you, there's always someone you're pissing off. Yeah. Right? Like, like you said, this is um, a picture of a duck. No, that's not a duck. It's a seagull. <laughs> okay. Like, yeah, and I understand yeah. that. I, I think it's more how do we, you know, you have the tools to be able to deal with it. That, like, that's what you're saying. It's, you know, we, we've had this. When Marilyn Manson came out, you know, that was Satanism. Mm. That was, you know, Nine Inch Nails, like all of these, Rage Against the Machine. Emos. Yeah, yeah all rock, of this stuff comes Elvis through. Presley. Yeah, no different than Sex Pistols. Um, and I'll go as far to say as Duran Duran with a totally, you know, not, not the words, but the imagery of girls on film. Like all of these things were like quite iconic because they made people think, shit, is this what it's really like? Mm. But you look at any film clip these days, <clears throat> it's pretty full on. It's pretty sexual. Yeah. And that's the norm for 10 year olds and up. Because. Don't you think it's fascinating though that we, like, if you go back a thousand years ago, we'll pr or probably even 2000 years ago, we we're probably walking around naked in cheesecloth. <laughs> and then now all of a sudden, like, we go through this era where we've got to go swimming in almost fully, I don't know. Remember uh, back in like the the 15, 16, 1700s, like you know, you're, you, you're you go clutching swimming. a few straws. But I know, I know what you, I know what you're getting at. I think it's society's come a full circle. Yeah, like have you watched <laughs> Naked in the Wilderness? No, I haven't. <laughs> On SBS, highly rated. Uh it's fucked up. Like, yeah. why would someone go fully naked on a show like Survivor? Attention. Yeah. The same okay, reason why 13 year old so, girls are getting half correct, naked on Instagram. Correct. And that's what I'm saying. I don't, it's a bit bizarre. It's a bit bizarre. So you go into, so you get through schooling. So obviously it was, it was an interesting time for you. Mm -hmm. I think. I think, yeah, it was. I what mean, was your after first job. Shit. Uh, I don't know. I was always hustling from a young age. I hate the word hustle because it's, but I just learned from a young age that. Mum and dad were always at parties and at parties there was always lots of food and f dishes needed to be cleaned and so I'd go around and collect $1 and $2 coins off of everyone and do the dishes and that's how I started making money. Well, my parents couldn't afford nice basketball shoes for me so I learned that if I put in work and I work hard then, you know, I can go and buy a nice pair of basketball shoes and so that's what I did. Um, I'm still, I still love shoes so, um, yeah. So, to what, that's one thing. Where did you start earning money from an employer uh the first proper job i had yeah well i started i i also the first time i actually made decent money was washing cars yeah um that wasn't through anyone else that was just through my dad's mates when they'd come around i'd wash their cars and i'd, I'd you know half detail the cars while they were there um and because i just love cars that was sort of like my thing then i worked at a service station I was just there as a cleaner, so I'd go and clean the toilets and all that stuff, which was fucking interesting. Um, as you can imagine, like of all the places you want to clean bathrooms or toilets, yeah. service station is probably the most disgusting thing that you're probably going to clean. Yeah, I, uh, I give apart you from a crime scene. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's. I think How some of them probably were a crime scene. Clean. <laughs> yeah. uh, I did it for about a year or so, um, and then. Then I worked as a cleaner at night time. So I actually realized that a lot of my mates were working at McDonald's and they were earning shit back in the day. It was like eight bucks or something an hour. Yep. And I think I was earning double doing nighttime cleaning. And so I'd go and clean like Parliament House or office buildings or the Hilton Hotel. Um, my dad would do it sometimes as a part-time job, but I'd either get a taxi or my parents would drop me in or dad would drop me in. And um, I would work from like 11 o'clock at night until one or two o'clock in the morning. Yep. Um, or I'll do like one o'clock until 4 a.m. And then they'd come pick me up and I'd go home, sleep for a couple of hours and go to school. Probably another reason why I wasn't, wasn't the best at school, but I was making money and I was making probably more money than, oh, I think I was probably making more money than any other student there. So, Oh, yeah. without a doubt at school. Mm. So you finished school. <clears throat> You're obviously not a marine biologist. Um, yeah, definitely not. Um, had a you know, bit of a tough upbringing, no doubt, by the looks of that. What? What was it that you started to do when you started to think, hang on, there's more to life than this? Well, so I just remember being at school and, and playing around with um, in metal work. And I thought, you know what? I think maybe the career that I want to go into is mechanics. But I also realized that there wasn't a lot of money in just being working, you know, doing normal mechanics. So I thought maybe the mining industry, because at the time it was the start of the mining boom, yep. um, BHP and Rio Tinto and all that were putting out jobs that there was enough mechanics um, it was part of the big, huge Roxby expansion. I thought, you know what, fuck it, I'll 
maybe I'll try for as a diesel mechanic. Um, and so I ended up getting in at Cav Power or Caterpillar here in South Australia and started working for them. So okay. yeah, that was that well, was as my a diesel first. mechanic. Yeah, yep. Like a fitter turner or uh, whatever you want to call it, but yep. yeah, diesel, diesel mechanic, diesel okay, fitter. Okay, so do you end up going in the mines at all? No, no. So no, I did. I did a couple of well. I did a couple of like as an apprentice, some work up in the mines just for a little bit, but I never went underground uh, or anything like that. And that was only as an apprentice. Pretty much the day I got signed off my apprenticeship was the day I quit. I like, got it finished. Yep. Like, that happens so often. Yep. We had Freeney in here the other day, got his degree, that was it. Never again. Yep. I have people who've said to me like over the years, you can always go back. And I was like, man, I could think of probably about maybe a trillion other careers that I could probably do as well. So yeah. it just yeah. depends what you want to do. So, yep. Then did you do anything? So what made you start to invest in people? So I, what started happening was around about my first year as a mechanic, I noticed that every day I was going into work, people were complaining, everyone was bitching and moaning. I just, I'd sit around the lunch table and it was like, I don't know, being at a fucking old people's home where everyone just complained about how shit life was. Um, and they were earning good money. They were coming back from the mines. And it was just this really shitty, toxic environment that I just didn't want to be part of. And I started feeling really depressed. Um, also, a lot of the guys, a lot of the apprentices that came in, their background was farming or working on, you know, heavy diesel shit. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that diesel shit is a correct term, but you get what I'm talking about. I know what um, about. <clears throat> tractors or, you know, mining equipment, things like that. Whereas I'd come from a car background, so I guess I needed a little bit more help in understanding how a lot of the stuff works because I'd never seen it before. Um, and again, it was just a really toxic environment. A lot of the guys didn't really want to help out the apprentices. So, you know, I was thinking, what else What else can I do? What do I enjoy? And I remember looking through the newspaper one night and I thought I wanted to be a massage therapist because I'd always loved understanding the body. Like I started training or lifting weights when I was 13 just so that I could feel better about myself. Um, and my dad was always into football or um, he would always be running or doing sports. So I thought I'll just, you know, train with dad. But that also started developing to me going to the gym after work. <clears throat> and when I got there, when, I, when I'd get to the gym, everyone was like happy. So I just thought, here's this place where these dudes finish work. Everyone sort of looks after each other. They support each other. It's just this really cool environment. And back in those days... I mean, this was probably 2003, 2004. Uh, yeah. You know, gyms weren't a big thing. Um, not like they are now. They weren't everywhere, <clears throat> you know. And um, I just thought maybe this is something that I, I – maybe a career that I want to get into. And I was flicking through the paper and it said become a personal trainer. And then I just remember thinking this is what I want to do, but also being scared shitless that I'd pretty much failed everything at school. And here I am as an adult going back to learn at my own choice and my own free will. So it brought up all the thing of like being a dumb fuck, getting put in special classes, you know, I'm not going to be able to pass. Um, but I thought I'll give it a crack anyway. And um, I remember going and signing up and I think it was the, the best thing that I ever did. So what sort of nutrition did you study? I studied through the Czech Institute. So the way it all started was I did a lot of the study through TAFE. I did a, a diploma of fitness um, through there as well. I started working at Viva Fitness at Kidman Park or uh, KP Fitness. And then I helped them build a franchise system. And I started going out and educating other trainers. And that's really where I found my love of speaking. But also around that time, the gym owner or the gym manager was pretty forward thinking. And I think we used to bounce off of each other quite a lot. And we realized that there was this area that really hadn't been focused on and that was working with uh, like other health professionals physios chiropractors doctors so we started working with some other health professionals and so i'd go out and educate other personal trainers so at the time they were essentially the majority of them were just meatheads or um group fitness sort of girls um i mean that was the majority of that industry at the time so yeah just went out and group fitness like like jump around jump up and down okay, you know yeah. aerobic style mm -hmm. sort of stuff um, for well, those of doing, you who are old enough to remember that stuff. Well, yeah, like Gene Simmons. <laughs> so, sort of. I don't think that was a Ruby Costa. I think that was rock and roll, but it's same, same, but different. That's so um, funny. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just started doing that. And that's where I realized that I love speaking and I loved educating, um, even though it scared the shit out of me at the time. And I just wanted to keep helping people. So I started studying nutrition through the Czech Institute out of the US, um, started doing some of their, uh, their kinesiology. And I got headhunted by Fitness First at Highmush when it first started here to go and work there. Um, and I guess to help bring up some of the new young trainers that came through. 
And then I got headhunted the year after to go and work in a medical center here on Grange Road called Pro Healthcare. And so I ran that with, um, well, I, I started running it myself. And then I brought in Adam Murphy, who is now the strength conditioning coach for the Adelaide 36ers. and does a lot of stuff with basketball. Um, so I, I recently had a, a moment at gym. Mm -hmm. We were doing, I go there. I hate the gym. Like, I'll really? be honest. Yeah, I, I'm there because I, I need to eat. So I, like I said, I've got to do it. So one of the pieces was I do weights and then I do a CrossFit a cardio. So I do the weights and then I do the CrossFit cardio after. So two sessions, I'm up early. I might as well go there. I think I've seen some pictures of you training with James Newberry. Well, he owns the gym and okay. trust me, <laughs> he ain't training with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, I only just recently worked with James just before the CrossFit Games. <clears throat> A freak of nature. Yeah, he's he's definitely... Uh, no, there's no... Like, you watch what he does at the gym. I say, like, fuck. It's like watching the CrossFit Games. It's, they don't... They, it's, oh, they That ain't me. I, I don't know why. They're I'm a different very, build, that's for... Or a different breed, that's for sure. Like, I'm very the positive in everything and, I do in life, except for going to the gym. And the last few weeks, I've tried to not whinge about it. I've just thought... Just try it. So, get there. We're doing a session. And one of the guys, he is a works at AIS. AIS. He's probably not listening, so I'm not. I'm gonna say it. Um, <clears throat> he also does some psychological stuff for the crows. And I went, shit, mate, that hasn't fucking worked, has it? <laughs> and he looked at me and he's like, mate, do you follow sport? <laughs> and I was like, oh fuck, like this is like at six in the morning. And I'm like, <laughs> and I could tell. I touched a nerve and I don't know him well enough to give him shit, but I was like, yeah. And he goes, well, we're rebuilding. I said, yeah, rebuilding and last. Like, it doesn't sound like too much going on in the performance area. And it really, I could tell, <laughs> like it just pissed him off. And I was like, yeah, it's okay. No, I don't watch much. Like, you know, they're rebuilding. Oh, okay. They're rebuilding, but they're rebuilding at last. Oh. That's okay. Okay. Well, and I, then I couldn't help myself. Say, well, if coming last is great performance, then I'm sure everything's okay. <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, fuck! I, he, I just could tell I pissed him off. Didn't sound like you were baiting him or anything like that. No, it. it but <laughs> what I said, I, I, well, I wasn't. <laughs> But he really got defensive, and I like when people get defensive because it shows they care. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I couldn't help myself. But anyway, that was my gym session about performance coaching. And I was like, Ooh. so here we are. You know, what should you be telling me now? Because this was my, I'm going to be positive. I'm not going to, I'm not going to stoop myself. So I started to be, come on. Yep, you got this. <laughs> uh, and I reckon I was good at it. But when What's that, I. performance coaching? Yeah. Okay. I was coaching and lifting some, where well, we do bench press every Tuesday, which sucks. I've tried to tell the coach. They're going to, they're going to stop doing bench press every Tuesday because that's all I do. Like, I'm sick of because of Tuesday is the day I go. Anyway, so I could tell I touched You'll have nerve. that, like, full-blown gorilla chest and you'd be walking around all hunched. Yeah, and well, I'm not. Like, look, I, yeah, I was a crow. I'm a crow's man, right? And here I am just sort of giving my advice. And do you follow sport, mate? And I was like, okay, touch the nerve. Anyway, so- Sport is horrible, by the way. Like, so if he's working with sports teams- He is. He's working with sports- people well sports teams are a head fuck in themselves i've been brought into port Adelaide football club and they had uh, I, I was brought in there because they were underperforming many years ago and everything oh, hang on hang on is this seriously they got a chance to win the grand final like right, this year and is, is this oh and because of me no 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 i'm no. here no i don't follow mojo's sport. here guys you've got your mm. mojo get your <laughs> shit together because it's showtime i don't follow sport to be honest like okay. i don't have time for uh, it but uh, um well I'd, I'd rather be doing stuff than watching someone else do it so yep um agree yeah so um or, or i'd rather be hanging out doing other shit than watching someone else kick a fucking leather skin around an oval but anyway that's that's me not not many other people like that but um <laughs> There's I, plenty. I love helping them perform better. But it, sporting teams are really fascinating because, I, like I said, I, I got brought into Port Adelaide. Everything was all set up for me to start working with the power. And then all of a sudden they had a change of coaching staff. And then, bang, I was just completely forgotten about. 
I got brought into work with Cricket SA by um, one of the head of the coaching staff. Started working in there, change of coaching staff, bang, just fucking cut out. And it's interesting because in sporting, sporting teams are very similar to corporate business as well. And it seems to be the same thing. It's got to go through this crazy hierarchy. Everyone's got to tick the boxes, yep. fucking check yep. everything off. Yep. Yeah, and it's not about well, making the players perform better. It's about making sure that you don't fuck anything up. That's really all it is. It, it's They create all these safety nets and these safety barriers. Cricket SA brought me in, and I won't say who it was who brought me in, but um, he essentially said, we've got, we're, we're bringing you in because we need, number one, even though we've got people who work in the mental health space, they're only there to stop the players killing themselves. They were his exact words. Um, but we need to teach these young guys how to be young men. And also we need to help them to perform better and to, you know, get the best out of them because they might only be here for a year. And they've, they've essentially worked from four or five years of age to 18 or 19 and their career might be over in a year. Yeah, I, I, I can... The, the window of an athlete's <clears throat> very small. It is. Unless you play darts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just or saying. Or beer pong if it's, uh, uh, yeah. you know. 108, dude. Like, <laughs> like everyone has watched darts. I, I, like I have. But when you're talking about high-level performance and I think being involved with the team, it's actually fascinating. So I've got multiple friends that have done things with teams. Mm -hmm. And um, it's interesting to watch because, I mean, as an athlete, if you're getting paid, you're privileged. Mm. And everyone has all their dramas in life. I get it, but it, it must be interesting to look, you know, look on at the outside. Of, of your psychologist point of view for that, or what, what? What sort of advice are you giving? Are you giving a team? Like, is there? Well, you, know, you sit in the room and you all get the, you know, get the notepad out and start you know, writing what makes you happy in life, or what? What, what exactly? None of that stuff. So here's, I guess, here's my point of difference. Right, is that the whole positive thinking methodology is flawed. And that's my that's my thing. A quick look into physics disproves positive thinking, just like that. Because anything in nature that has a positive charge attracts a negative charge in order to stabilize. Oh, I like this terminology. Yeah. Now humans, we we can choose. Thank you. Um, we can choose to have a stable mindset, or we can choose to have an unstable positive mindset. And we've all met those fluffy duffy people who run around and pretend that everything's okay and their life's fucking shit. And yep. you know. That doesn't help them achieve anything. And just, you know, you're a business owner. I'm a business owner. There's not only do you have to look at what could possibly go right in order to run a business or even to achieve anything, you've also got to be pessimistic enough to realize that things can go wrong and mitigate risk. So I think the whole positive thinking, everything's going to be all right, be optimistic, that whole model is completely flawed. Really, everything in nature, if you look right through the fields of physics, chemistry, and the hard sciences, everything is trying to go back to its most stable form. So mental stability isn't positive thinking. And Correct. so I teach people like, if you're a professional athlete, the goal isn't to be positive. The goal is to use certain tools at certain times, depending on what you're doing. For instance, like if I'm working with a professional boxer or, or, or which I've worked with world champion kickboxers and so on, um, when you're working with them, if they're fighting a lot under a lot of aggression, a lot of anger, they're gonna be highly adrenaline driven. If they go longer than one or two rounds, they're gonna burn out. And that's how some of the guys that I've worked with lost world titles because if they, they would demolish a person the first round, but after they did that for a while, people started realizing if you just put your guards up and stay there for long enough, they'll burn out. Now that's not an effective strategy anymore. So a change in strategy is going there more emotionally balanced. Um, when I was working with James and we're talking about some of this stuff, you know, there are certain things where he has sh very short time periods. Like if he's on the air bike and he's got to do 50 calories in the shortest time yep. frame. That is pump yourself up, jack yourself up, massive amounts of adrenaline and go as hard as you absolutely can into that pain threshold, but you're going to crash afterwards. Whereas something where he might be doing something for an hour, you can't have that same amount of adrenaline or that same rush because yeah. if you do, you're going to burn out and you're going to crash. Yeah. And that's where athletes start really, really well and then they crash and burn. So certain tools need to be effective at certain points in time, depending on what they're doing. And I think that's unfortunately where the mental health industry and the psychology industry fall short is that they're always looking, as a majority, are looking at positive thinking, be happy all the time. Life's not about fucking happiness. We're the only animals on the planet who think that it is. Every animal on the planet is set to evolve. Well, this is interesting. So 
So are you telling me you know what a bird thinks? I have no idea what a bird thinks, <laughs> but I've never seen a fucking bird smiling either. You know? <laughs> okay. All right. That was quick. I think monkeys smile, but I can't. That's normally because they're slinging shit at people watching them. That still happy. Still yeah, happy. Yeah, I guess I'd be yeah. happy if I was yeah, slinging no, shit no, at people I'm, who, I like, who are watching I like, me. I actually like you have a And they don't of, wear pants. I, I like you have a point. Fuck, I would hate not wearing pants. I mean, I just feel sorry. It says for a lot the, about what you got on downstairs. I, 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 I feel sorry for what all the other guys would be thinking. Sorry, I'm like <laughs> a one and a half deep now. It's- but I, I, look at, I look at things like you actually have an opinion. And I, to me, that's very valuable. Well, it's an educated one. Yeah. But it's your opinion. Well, so, it's scientific. It's well, I, I, you know, because I, I, how does anyone know if something's happy? Like, how, how do you know what actually, in your mind, what constitutes happiness? I don't know. That's why I don't. Th- I don't think it's a great formula for life. Yeah. Because I mean, if you look like you're a, you're a driven guy, I'm a driven guy. I can have moments of happiness, but that that's not what fulfills me in life. What fulfills me in life is challenging myself to try to achieve something that maybe I didn't think I could, overcoming obstacles, pushing myself beyond my capabilities, um, maybe doing things that scare me or challenge me, whether that be, you know, for someone like you might be having kids, for me, it might be building a business, you know, everyone's different and we've got these value hierarchies. So there's a field of study called axiology and it looks at value structures. Now, every human being on the planet apparently has a different value structure. And for everyone who has a high value, there has to be a counterbalancer of that same value structure. If you look into cosmology, there's a theory um, which if you look at the net sum charge of the universe, it's zero, which means there are no positives or negatives. Everything, well, there could be positives or negatives, but they balance each other out back to zero or neutral. Now, that's- Yeah, okay. I I understand. It's like yin and yang. That's exactly the philosophy, I, I'm, right? I'm, so I'm, I'm with you at the force field, so I, uh, you haven't lost me. <laughs> so the yin and yang philosophy, that philosophy has been around for thousands of years. And it's not only the Chinese that, that have that philosophy. If you go back, it's the ancient Egyptians, it's the, Indi- yeah. um, you yeah, know, 100%. India. Um, so go, the greatest civilizations have always had a similar idea and a similar thought. Yet for some weird reason in our society, we think that positive thinking, being happy all the time, joy, all these all these words make life great, but I completely disagree with that because if we're chasing happiness, we might be losing fulfillment. Mm-hmm. Now, fulfillment is going, you know, I don't think I can fucking achieve that, but I'm going to have a crack at it anyway. And then when you get there, you go, cool, what else can I do? And, you know, I say in a lot of my events, the greatest gift that I can help someone to find is their self-worth. I can give you happiness by giving you a pizza or a glass of wine or whatever. Like we can have momentary happiness. But that's completely different from the idea of fulfillment, the same as you with your kids. Like watching them do cool shit that you might not have ever thought that they would be able to do or you've never even considered to see them to grow and to learn and to evolve as a person, I assume would be pretty fucking cool as a parent. Yeah. Now, that can be the same as business as well, as your business evolves, depending on what your value structure is. Yeah, I, like I, I'll agree on the fulfillment side is different mm. than the happiness side. Yeah, so why the fuck are most people chasing happiness? Yeah, I, no, I don't think most people are. I think they are. That's why depression rates are so high. Uh, I, interesting, because I believe it's an important chemistry for success. Happiness or fulfillment? Uh, now, fulfillment's <laughs> definitely up there. Yeah. I found- and I think happiness is too, because I think it puts you in a different frame of mind. Uh, I'm not saying they're, I'm saying they're together. I don't, I don't think you can treat them. I'm only looking for happiness because I would say most people on the planet don't throw the fulfillment into it. That's, that's because they misunderstand it. Yeah. And but- I think the industry as a whole, especially in the mental health space, are throwing around these key terminologies without really thinking through it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I like the idea of adding the fulfillment to it. I actually, I, I say the key to life has actually been happy. But I, when you do say about, well, you need to be fulfilled, yeah, I, I see happiness does provide some fulfillment, some. But I also think if you added other things to fulfill, it makes the complete package and maybe the word's not happiness. Yeah, I've ne- yeah, And it no, could I've also actually- create unhappiness as well because when you perceive that you don't have the things that you perceive will make you happy they can also make you feel like shit too 100 percent. 
Mm. And I haven't had anyone address it like with the fulfillment side. Mm. And there's no doubt about that. I, mm. I actually 100% agree with you on that. Well, there's, I mean, diving into a little bit in neuroscience, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but I do study what I can to, to try to figure this stuff out. If you have a look at the brain, there's a gating mechanism in the brain. And, and I bring this up in my events and I say, if you, if you think about a scenario, so we're in this room, I see you sitting across from me. Let's go and look at the, the science of that. Your eyes take in electromagnetic radiation. So they don't, you don't see anything. It then feeds information into the brain structure and there's different parts of the brain. So you've got the visual cortex, but there's also a part of the brain called the thalamus. And that's, there's a gating mechanism in that in your brain. And you see the world based on your value structure and your value hierarchy, the way that's unique to you. And everyone sees the world completely differently. 100%. Now, when we have this idea of happiness, what, what does that fucking mean? And well, I've watched a movie. Okay, go on. <laughs> <laughs> the Pursuit of Happiness. Okay. And when you see that, it's that's like down and out, nothing to, you, you can never get there. You know, there's lots of other issues there, but it's not actually happiness they're looking for. Mm. And it's exactly what you're saying. Well, it's, As it's not what most people are looking for, yeah. but most people confuse it. Yeah. And something that I learned, you know, years ago in physics is what goes up has to come back down. So the more you chase highs in your life, you know, if you just look at a drug addict, they have highs and it's an elated state. It's an elated emotional feeling. There's neurochemistry involved in it. There's hormonal changes. When that happens, they go into a crash afterwards. And we've all been through crashes of elated states or when we've been overexcited. You know, even if we just run on high energy, like, I mean, if we're drinking, uh, I don't know if I can say certain companies. Yeah, or, but, mate, there's no, you know, hey, we, there's no, we are the non-biased. Um, oh, I'll cover this. Uh, but these no, certain. It's, <laughs> it's Red Bull. Hey, Red Bull, if you're watching. Um, at or listening. No, there's we, there's no bias, but I know what you're talking about. So you, you drink lots of that. You have this rush of energy. You become hyperactive, but that leads to hyperactivity where you're eventually going to have an energy crash. So anything in nature that seems to get hyped up or have a high also has a low as well, and it has to have a come down. Now, I watch this from going to personal development events where people are jumping up and down for days. They're high-fiving strangers. You know, they're hugging everybody. And... I watch them come home and two or three days later, they're all sick, they're depressed, they're down, they've set these unrealistic expectations. Like, you know, when we're elated, we tend to set goals that are beyond our capacity for achievement in, a, in the timeframes that we give them. Whereas when we're depressed, we don't think that we can achieve anything in the timeframes that we have. So our emotions can distort our ability to set effective goals. So my strategy is don't be too elated don't be too depressed. There's a nice balance point in the center. Go for emotional balance or mental stability more than trying to be happy or joyful or have these hyperactive states because if not, you've got to crash. And then when you crash, most people feel guilty. You know, the the key people that I work with, are the majority of them are business owners or they are people who are driven to achieve more in life. Now, they're completely different than the majority of the people that the mental health industry work with. So very rarely do I meet someone who says, I don't want to work and I don't want to push the limits. They work too much. And then when they rest, they feel guilty for resting. So it's almost like 180 degrees the opposite. The average person feels completely happy resting and they almost feel like shit working. It's almost like 180 degrees around. Now, that's not everybody, but uh, it's, no, uh, you know what I mean? Now, those I, the, the key thing that I have to teach them is that you can't perform at your best unless you learn how to rest effectively. That's both mentally and physically. You can be resting physically, but beating the shit out of yourself up in your own head. That's not rest. You're still creating cortisol and the stress hormones and all that stuff. Your body's not effective at rest. So you have to learn how to rest both physically and mentally. And there's a time and a place for both. I don't, know, I don't even know how the fuck we got onto this. I'm like a couple of wines deep. You keep filling up my cup. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great way to look at it. I, yeah, it's actually, you've actually changed the way that I, I've never added fulfillment into that mix hmm. and it's just common sense. Now, now I look at it, yeah. it's like the fulfillment part it is the crucial part. Hmm. Same as gratitude, but gratitude is like when you, when you look at your kids and they're asleep, you'll have gratitude, but that's also where you know that they're a massive challenge in your life, but they've also been an amazing gift in your life as well. That's gratitude. 
So gratitude isn't what most people think gratitude is. Most people see gratitude as an elated state where they're hyperactive or they have this like overwhelming sense of like pride or achievement. They're all elated states. Gratitude is that calmness that you just have where you just look at something and just like, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. It's not up, it's not down, it's just, it is what it is. And that's what the mystics have said. This is what science, science and great science and great mysticism are very similar or great philosophy are very similar. And they're trying to find answers to the same questions. The problem is you've got fringes of both where you've got craziness on both sides. The crazy scientists think that science can prove every, everything and anything that's not proven isn't scientific. Yep. But that's fucking erratic and stupid because there's more that we don't know in the universe than what we do know. We do. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it's not science. It just means that we no one's asked the questions yet or we don't have the philosophy yet to ask the right questions in order to find the science behind it. Then you've got some people who are fluffy duffies who just run around everywhere and think that everything's energy and if we just think certain things, they just happen. Well, we also know that that's probably fairly logical, but there's also some sense of that as well. It's just where's that center point? Where's the beauty right in the center? Well, there's definitely something about the law of attraction mm. and the universal energy. And it sounds like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm spiritual. I <laughs> but, you know, the amount of times, and this is a layman way of putting it, where I ring someone and they go, fuck, I was just thinking of you. Mm. Now, I don't know. Does everyone else get this? But I get it all. My mum says it all the time. So I know she's, <laughs> I know my mum's lying. But when I say it to people that I, you know, I purposely put aside time during the week to ring people I don't normally ring. And I enjoy it because it's like, oh, I haven't spoken to you for a while, blah, blah, blah. My mate, they've got Ben, Shaw, he's in Melbourne. And, you know, they're doing it tough. they got lockdowns. You know, it's a shit show over mm. there. But when I ring him, he goes, man, I knew you'd ring today. And, like, I was like, it, there's something about it. Mm. And there's something about how the universe acts on it. What are you fucking smiling about, Ollie? <laughs> just trying to be nice. No. I'm not just trying to be... It, do you oh, think so? No, that's right. Do you think so? Like when my mum does it, I discredit it. But when your mates go, oh, I was about to call you today. Or like, Surely I don't say that shit. Do people make that shit up? Look. Oh, I was going to call you today. Who the fuck? What? So many people would make that up to me. Um, don't ruin it. I, so um, I guess I'm Ollie, scientific. So Don't fucking ruin it. <laughs> like don't use... It Sometimes does. I'm like, oh, JP, and then, yeah. Bang. Thank you. And you? You call me every hour. So, <laughs> so it's really bound to happen. Say. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I, it, you think, it's a, hang on. I haven't thought about this. Do you think they're just doing it just to be nice? To not feel guilty about not calling you. <laughs> like my mate, I'm catching so, up on Sunday. I haven't seen him for like six months. I'm just like, yeah, man, you know, I'm... Um, thinking about you when he called me up like last week i was like oh, fuck, i haven't thought about you for six months <laughs> now you just dropped it on the podcast <laughs> no that's gonna get <laughs> bullshit we're gonna this leave is, that in uh, well i i have this effect is it because i i do make contact with people i actually honestly care about people even if i haven't spoken to them my mate richard thompson we were best mates at school did a lot of shit together and now I might ring him twice a year and it's like I've been speaking to him like I'm best friends, mm. which we are, but we don't speak every day, speak once a year. Mm. But you ca I'm connected. And whether that's from what happened as we were younger, but the connection's still there. Mm. Like I got sent the other day, I didn't get sent, I found it, Carl Cox did a live mix, Carl Cox in his basement. Send it. But... This is the trippy part. He mixed the whole lot. No no records. He he actually live played like 303s. Like it it was phenomenal. And I was like, oh, and Tomo, my mate, he was out of all of us. I was DJing. Tomo was making music. And I sent it to him and he went, holy fuck. He goes, dude, I was about to go to work. I, I actually sat in a car, watched the whole thing. <laughs> and it was one of those things that was like. So he didn't work. No, he, d he does work, but not for the hour. Okay. But he said, blew my mind. I couldn't not watch it. Because as soon as I saw that, bang. I, I do, if I see something that I think, oh, that is that person, I'm um, straight away. I, and I, I don't know. I, I think that's about being connected. Yeah, I do that as well. But you probably have a high value on connection or people. High. 
Yeah. My I got more value on people and connection than I think of anything. Mm. And you, you you touched on some points, mm. like when you look at your kids when they're asleep. I, you know what strikes me is really it's really hard for someone that doesn't have kids to be able to say that. Like I I I look at and the way you said it was actually genuine, but it's one of those. Because I understand value systems. Yeah. Mm. It, I, I I wish I knew what I knew about kids now before I had kids. Mm. Or if I'm one of the lucky few people on the planet that can have kids. Like, I, it's very hard for someone to relate like that. It was interesting seeing you tie that bow because, yeah, well done. Because I don't think many people can actually do that very mm. successfully. So. Yeah. It's, it's just value systems. Like, everyone has a hierarchy of values that to them are important to them. And so what's Ollie's What's Ollie's hierarchy of values? Not like, here. I'd have to sit there and like, but what, I, just, what, I just gathered it from the way you were talking about your kids. So it's like, I teach this stuff in different workshops on like sales or business because the people that you're talking to have a, have a structure of values. And if you don't understand their values, it's very hard to communicate with them. And that's where miscommunication happens. For someone like me, if you, you know, like I have a high value on teaching and learning, or it's my highest value, and then my second highest value is connecting with people who are people that I love to learn from or people that I can help or teach. Now, I find it extremely boring to just hang out with people and talk about just generic shit because my hierarchy of values dictates if I'm not learning from them or I don't get to help them that I just blank out. It's almost like I get bored. And we all have those people that we get bored around, but that's because our values dictate that. And I teach people in my events like... I did a, a seminar only recently or um, like an online event and it was about guilt. The reason why people feel guilty is because they have implanted values from someone else telling them how to live. It's not their fucking guilt. It's someone else's saying you should act this way and you should behave that way. You don't really want to behave that way. It's just that you've been told from someone else so you take on their value structure. But then at the same time, you lose yourself in that in that process which you devalue yourself, you reduce your self-worth, You start to question yourself and then there's a whole bunch of emotional shit that goes with that as well. So, you know, you've got less chance of succeeding. A person's wealth is directly tied to their value system. So their earning potential drops. There's a whole bunch of things that go on. So like I'll work with workplaces on value structures and things like that because if people aren't put in the right jobs for their values, then they're not going to be aligned. Like if you hire someone who, let's say their highest value is family. Now they're working because they perceive that they need to work in order to make money. Now, that I wouldn't say that that's necessarily the best thing for them, but let's just say that they've got to do that. They're a single parent. They've got to work to make money. At 5.30, if that's knockoff time, they're going to be wanting to go home because all day they've been thinking about their family and they've been thinking about the kids. So they don't want to work past 5.30. Now, if they're in a career where they need to work until 7 or 8 o'clock, you can hold them there for a short period of time, but they're going to be completely distracted. They're going to be emotionally volatile. They're probably going to feel guilty. They're probably going to binge eat, drink alcohol, take drugs. There's a whole bunch of a side effect or side effects, which are the effects of them living outside of their values. So true. Mm. Like, and I even see it with that. We we have five and a half thousand team members, which is relatively large, mm. and it's really hard to balance all that up mm. because it, you know it depends where you are in your life cycle, depends where you are on your life. And we see that all the time. Mm. And your saying is exactly right. Some people it is here like now, and then once they have a family, it is different. Mm. And then we all know the first, fuck, (laughs) I think it's never ending, but the first five years are hell. But that's how it changes the the value of where you sit, where where things sit. And that's what you're saying. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm. It's hard to balance that too, because that role might be fine, and then you have kids and then you've somehow got to reevaluate. Yeah. But you can't just go, okay, next job. Okay, next job. So how do you They might have to though. Okay. So how do you tell how, how does someone balance that without so, that okay next job? Well, like I'll, I'll give you a great example. If you don't have if you've got a customer service person and they don't have a high value on people or connecting with people, they're gonna essentially be a shit customer service person. But if you've got a person who has a high value on structure putting them in a creative job role might be the worst thing for them. It all depends on what their other values are and their top three values are gonna dictate the way that they perceive reality. Now, I'll give you a couple of different examples to, to make sense. Yeah, um, let's, let's do this, I'm, I'm curious. Shit, I'm, I'm getting into like the whole 
no, like crazy is, psychology I don't want, this I don't, I'm not looking for sales. No, no. It's, I, I like the, like, because I, I, I'll be honest, I looked at your site and I was like seeing what you do. I was like, fucking hell, people do this. And for me, I'm like staggered because I learn my stuff and I'm like, okay, I've got, I'm lucky. I have mentors around me mm -hmm. that I agree with them on some stuff. I don't like, mm. so I take the best of every world and make my mm. own world. And I watch what you do and you have your world and then people come to you that might be missing something in the equation. And I believe, I'm guessing, you try to give them that part of what they're missing. Maybe if you want to look at it that way, we're all, oh, missing, no, that, we're all missing something. Yeah. No, um, well, so one of the things that I say to people is, look, I'm, I'm not here to be a fucking martyr and I assure you haven't walked across water yet. So... And the reason why I say that is because- You would have put it on Instagram. No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be Instagram. <laughs> I, I definitely would have. Well, not now. My account just got hacked last week, so I'm just waiting to get it back. Is that what it was? We That's were all was. trying to figure out what the fuck happened. No, nah, my account got <laughs> hacked. Um, it was unfortunately last Wednesday. I was with a heap of the boys and our account was going nuts. Um, I was with Sam Fricker, the Olympic, um, like he just got back from the Olympic Games. And I was with a couple of the other boys who- you know, have a million plus on uh, TikTok and, and that. And so the Instagram Sam was getting smashed. No. no, he's a diver. Oh, that's good because you weren't at a, a legal party. No. Nah. Okay. I'm just, <laughs> no. I'm just... Why should have I been? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next time you find me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so anyway, where was I? Yeah, the t the, yeah, so the Instagram the account, account got shut down. Yeah, that day I was sitting there at lunch, just logged into my account. And then I got an email through that said, pay me 10 grand or else your account's gone. And I went, fuck it, take my account, whatever. Fuck, this is serious? Yeah. Like, how would they want the money? Uh, they, well, they wanted in crypto. They'd set it up. They, they, they did reasonably well to, to hook it up, but- um, So do you think it's someone you know or you think it's hacked? It's definitely- This it's, is raw. It's definitely it's hacked happened. because I got, I, I, I have a few friends who work in that space to- go and sort of have a bit of a sniff around yeah and it was whoever's doing it did it reasonably well so okay. they've they set up accounts and stuff in switzerland and things like that to make sure that certain things can't be tracked or fuck i want an account in switzerland everyone has everyone that's cool has a, an account in switzerland do you guys have an account in switzerland yeah, that's what I thought. Money, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mate, Jordan guy, Belfort did. <laughs> this guy's a crypto bandit, mate. He, his crypto's up like a few dollars and he shows her. He's, it's like he's won the lottery. It, it's quite impressive. I, I, I like it. Huh. No shit. So that happened on the internet. How, many, Last how week? many followers did you have? Like? Oh, it's only five and a half thousand. So someone's had five and a half thousand. And you've gone. And then wanted me ten. And then they and wanted gone, ten grand. I was you, like, fuck you. Yeah, whatever. But yeah. So that was last week. Just waiting to get my account back. So back to the hierarchy. Yeah, I'm fascinated by this. Cool. So you're what? Oh, so so do do as a as someone do, do do you think that everyone needs to have their values, three values or something? Do you think they need to have some values where they know what they are? Well, or it just helps you navigate life, like. You know, the cool thing is I get to work with extremely successful people who are already successful. They don't need me, they, but they have a burning desire to be better. They want to understand themselves better. So, you know, like when you were saying, they, do people, uh, are people missing something so they come to me? I think that's the model of like the personal development industry is that, you know, I, I feel shit about life. Maybe I'm not achieving what I want. So I go to the personal development event and I get all happy and I feel good about myself and I set some unrealistic goals and then I chase them and then tell myself, you know, I'm a piece of shit when I crash and burn again and then I go to another one. That's sort of the vibe of that industry. And that's what I found when I went through it. What I do though is I don't care who it is. Every person on this planet that I've come across has a burning desire to be better. Nature says that things that don't evolve get turned back into compo uh, compost or, you know, they get, get rid of out of the environment. Yep. Um, and they, they go extinct. So I believe that most people don't want to go extinct. They want to be better. But unfortunately, in our society, at the moment, there's part of a thing that rewards people for who, who don't do that. You know, we can all take on the victim card and our victim mentality and say, well, it's not me, it's my fucked up past. But that doesn't help you create to create a greater future. My whole thing is, 
why don't we build a great future for you by understanding yourself first and what you really want to achieve at your core, and then you can leave all that shit behind and move forward towards something. And what I find is that when people don't have something to move towards, they'll stay where they are. Yeah, that, I, I do that. Everyone does and that. I, and I think I have plenty of things to achieve. Yeah. I, when I'm on song for things, I'm far more productive, far, mm. my mind is a lot clearer and I stay on the straight and narrow. Yeah. But when I don't, but, but the, the saying, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. 100% if, it is. If I wasn't doing what I was doing, I would be scary. Mm. Go on. You like most, <laughs> I think yeah. most entrepreneurs that I work with are what? like ADD, crazy, highly creative, and they have two ways. It's like, I, I'm going to build something of value in the world or I'm going to go to jail. And it's like, there's that, there's that sort of like, believe it or not, my, it's true, right? Because we're always like trying to outsmart the system. It's like part of the game. It's so true. I, I That's exactly how I think. I go and talk to my accountant. He's like, you can't do that. It's fraud. And I'm like, fuck, but it, it was like a good idea. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's. I hope the ATO aren't listening, but <laughs> the point, you know, it's, it, we're creative. Like <laughs> on, entrepreneurial people are creative. Um, uh, uh, we're driven. Uh, we, you, you've got this burning desire to want to create something. So when I see those people, I, I mean, even tonight, even later tonight, I'm, I, I'm on the phone chatting with one of the rich listers who's been to many of my events. He doesn't need me, but he knows that he can be better and he's looking for other people who can help him excel. Just like professional athletes don't need a personal trainer. They don't need a strength and conditioning coach. They got there on their own merit, normally from working with other people as yeah. well in those fields. Normally, most of them are highly intelligent. They're highly skilled. They don't need people. It's just that they know that building a team of great people around them helps them to excel. And they feel like they're leaving something on the table. And I don't think there's anything worse. Like imagine being an AFL footballer, and I've worked with a few of them, where you get into the AFL and you're with a whole bunch of other people, yet they're using a great team of people to help them to excel. And now you're just an average. Before you weren't an average, you were great. And now you just became an average. We all are on that borderline of, are we just an average or are we going to be great? And so I think people who tend to hire me and come to my events, they want to be better. They want to be great at something. And it might be being a great mother. It might be being a great father. It could be being great in business. It could be being great in a relationship. Like they're all very similar things, but the number one thing that you need to understand is who you are as a person. And I think that's the thing that's missing in most people's lives. So I understand someone, a lead athlete, someone with a shitload of money. What about someone, and you must have customers, that they're just doing enough to get ahead. Yep. And they come to you and they're like, I'm going to give you a big stack of cash. Look, I don't know how much it is. Fuck, I'll take that. Uh, yeah. But I don't know who they are. But, Normally people don't give me stacks of cash. But, uh, well, but they're coming to you with a, like, you know, saying, hey, I want to get better. Yep. But they're, you, you know, you know yourself. They're mm. like, oh, they've just got their head above water. Yep. Do you treat them any different than you do someone else? No. Same. I mean, so I, I worked with a guy a little while ago, business owner, doing reasonably well. And not to get into a long story, but <laughs> he was thinking about ending his own life. And some shit had happened in his relationship and his family. And that was it. So I ended up getting a phone call late at night. And he runs through the whole thing. And I said, look. Here's, here's how we deal with it. Anyway, he came in and we had a session and I held him accountable. And I was fucking brutal. Now, I'm not here to win friends. I don't even have time for the fucking friends that I have. So I said to him, look, I'm, if you want to work with me, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to help you get, get a better outcome. And if that means that we create a friendship, then that's what it is. But at the same time, I need to do a job. You want to get an outcome. That's how we do it. Yeah. Now, in that, conversation it was extremely tough for him to hear some things and for him to be pushed now i don't tell people how to live because here's the thing none of us have figured out life so who the fuck am i to tell someone else how to live life 100%. that's not my job my job is how do i help you based on the science and the f the principles that i have from studying some of the greatest thinkers and some of the greatest scientists and some of the greatest philosophers on the planet how do i help you untangle all of the stuff that's going on in your head so you can figure out who you are and what you're here to do and give you the tools to go do that. That's my job. But I'm making fuck ups every day. I'm, I'm making mistakes as are we all. It's how we navigate them. You know, we all fall off the push bike. It's just how fast do you get back on? Some people it takes a lifetime to get back on the bike after they fall off. 
Some people hold on to that victim card for 30, 40 years. So when those people come to my events and, and you know, there's different tiers and things like that depending on where someone's at. But when someone comes to my events, the first thing is let's figure out who you really are and let's cut away all the shit that's not you because most of the voices in your head aren't you. They're somebody else. They're your dad. They're your mum. They're someone from school. They're the kid that called you fat, the kid that called you ugly, the person who said you'd get nowhere in life. That's driving your decision making. That doesn't help you to make intelligent decisions. So, yeah. So, you, if we go to people you look up to, are they like, are you like an Anthony, Anthony Robbins or, or no. it's like, there's no one? I personally don't really look up to anyone. There's, what I learned years ago is that when you look up someone, you're bound to put yourself down because you're comparing yourself to them and you're not them, you're you. So the best thing that you can do is just realize that they're doing the best that they have with the tools that they have and the people that they've surrounded themselves with. And you can do the same thing by studying their philosophies and trying to understand what worked for them and what didn't work for them. But at the same time, they're just people. You know, I've, I, I was lucky enough to work with one of Tony Robbins' top head coaches in Australia who was one of my original mentors. Great guy, but he's still stuck. He's still going around in circles. Great guy though. You know, I've, I've been able to travel around the world and work with amazing people like Dr. John Martini is a close friend of mine and, and I think he's probably one of the best human behavior specialists in the world. Um, Does he drink Do much? He never drinks at all. <laughs> I have not seen him drink at all. <laughs> Wait, the same Dr. Martini. Come on. <laughs> Jesus Christ. D Martini, but good call. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. This guy's not drinking for a while. Dr. Joe Dispenza, though, who um, I spoke with in Mexico, who is a neuroscientist. I got drunk with him in, in Mexico on tequila. He's a very fascinating guy. I, I can only imagine. Mm. And from Mexico, I'm sure eating the worm wouldn't be the last thing, would be the last thing that happens. Have you ever eaten the worm in the bottle of tequila? I have not eaten the worm in the bottle of tequila. Well, Hugh Evans, a friend of mine, made us do this. And so the, 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 in the tequila had a couple of worms in the bottom of it. They, to be honest, they look like maggots, but little. And they're like, oh, you got to have these. It's part of like up to the end of I've the bottle. I've seen them. They're like a little caterpillar yeah, sort yeah, of. Oh. Yeah. you got to do have this. Either, have you guys had them? Uh, you got uh, no, ill of the like a ill in a bottle of uh, vodka or something. Yeah, and it's, it's out the bottom. Yeah, oh. and, and I'm like, you know, you got to do this, like, blah blah blah. And I'm like, yeah, all right, Hugh, Hugh, who got me into everything probably first. So if Hugh's listening to this, you did, and we're like, all right, yeah, let's do it. And fuck, it was like an intense acid experience drinking a lot of tequila and these little witchy grub things. But it's a thing. If you're ever drinking tequila and the last thing is to eat this thing, you've got to eat it. I've never had acid, but I don't think I want to have that either. Well, it was out of body experience. Right? <laughs> okay. So, you know, that's just what happened. But how did we get onto tequila? Oh, Mexico. So, yeah. so you know, I think... There's More a value structure, and then I just ran the off the conversation. But anyway, no, that's go ahead. Fine, that's cool. <laughs> so when we talk about the value structure and have people that you look up to, you know, I look up to Gary V. Like, okay. am I am I like Gary V? No. Do I say things as they are? Yeah. I have lots of things that are very similar, and literally, like he says, I'll deliver you everything that I do because ninety nine percent of the planet won't won't do it. Yep. And it's so true. You mm. can deliver all sorts of information and you put a lot of stuff out for free mm. um, that technically I reckon if someone copied all your stuff, they'd probably figure out you, but... Oh, they wouldn't even be close, guaranteed. Not you, your, <laughs> what, what you're offering, right? They wouldn't even be close. So I have it all the time. In fact, one of the top business coaches in Australia copies half my shit and they're still not even close. Yeah, but that's... But no, no, no. That's what I'm saying. It's there, but people don't do it because mm. they need someone that takes them through the next few steps because those steps of figuring out who you are and what you want to mm. do and what beliefs you have and where your value triangle is, uh, you can't just, it's very rare to make up by yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I mean, I could copy your business, Yeah. but there's a lot of fuck ups and a lot of mistakes that have happened over the years over you know, yourself, yeah, 47 your dad, years. 47 years. That's 47 years worth of mistakes. That's 47 years worth of corrections. That's 47 years worth of learnings. That stuff, e even if you copy them, it's still extremely hard. 
you know, I, this is why I teach people just be yourself because it's your path, it's your journey. If you're copying someone else, you're always going to be behind them and a second rate version of them. Yeah. You're uh, better off just doing your own thing in your own way. A hundred percent. And I don't think I've ever copied someone, but I definitely look at some avenues like, oh, okay, mm. I like that. Okay, I like that. Okay, I like that. And then some of it gels, some of it doesn't. Mm. And I think that's up to the individual. Mm, I agree. And that's what obviously what you're saying. It definitely, definitely is up to the individual. Mm. And do you think people come to you at certain stages in their life? 100%. If I could get, uh, I put a post out the other day and actually I might have been in an in, in interview or something and I said, I wish I could get out what I teach to schools because I think that the understanding of what the, I call it the foundations. Like we've got an event called Thrive Time and that essentially is building your life map and your foundations of life. If you're not clear on one of those things, I've found that normally the house of card topples eventually. And So this life, survive, what is it? What is it? Thrive Time. Thrive Time. Yep. This isn't like going, oh, now how did you feel when you were one? How did you, like, yeah, what fuck you feel like, you, what, when, when you were when one? You were five. What's that got to do with where you're heading? No, you no, know, but what, when you were five and then you were 10, like I've just been at an event and they're sort of saying you've got to go back to the beginning. I was like, fuck, I can't remember really? what I did yesterday. And you're trying to ask me what I did when I was like five and then can 10 I, and then 15 and then 20. Well, can I tell you why those events and those sort of things disappoint me in the majority of cases? Not all of them. There's a time and a place for everything. And a mentor years ago, a guy called Paul Check, who owns the Check Institute, is a bit, a bit out there, but he always said, there's a little bit of truth in everything. Now, I think that those sort of things, there's a time and a place for it. But why are you worried about the past when you're looking forward at the future? You ever oh, tried to? Well, I'm not fucking agreeing to this. I, I know, but that's that's oh, my point for anyone who's listening, though, I, right? I'm like, like going, okay, you're asking me to talk about when I was five. I, I can categorically say I cannot remember one thing when I was five. Mm. And I look at a photo, and that's the only thing that goes, oh, I remember that. But if it wasn't for the photo, no recollection. Maybe I blanked it out. Maybe I didn't like that part part of my life. Mm. I don't know. So when people are telling me that we go back and we strip it down, I'm like, fuck you. Is that- I is like that. A- <laughs> that you, it sounds like you've been at my events. Because <laughs> I get all those people. I get normally normally what happens because like I'm, I don't want to say I'm the prick of the industry, but I am, right? Because he, here's the thing. I'm, I, I've tried so much. Like, you know, I've, I've spent over a million dollars on study. Now that's not just because- I'm super smart. It's because I'm inquisitive and I want to learn things and I think that I can always be better. And I've tr- I have I went and studied all different forms of spirituality. Now, there's probably plenty of shit that I haven't studied, but I went back and I studied philosophy from the greatest thinkers, you know, Marcus Aurelius, Plato, um, you know, all of those people. I go on, I, I watch a lot of the stuff even these days and read a lot of the books on people like Warren Buffett and the great thinkers. But then also I love physics and chemistry and trying to understand how they operate and how that impacts human behavior. What I find is that there's this whole need of going back and dealing with your past and that you're this fucked up thing right now that needs to go back to your past in order to deal with that, in order to move forward into the future. Part of that may be slightly true, but if you haven't created a greater future, you're going to get stuck in your past. And what I find is that majority of people spend the majority of their life stuck in the past. That's their guilt. That's their shame. That's their regret. That's all the shit yeah. that keeps coming up. How, how can you do that? That's like looking at the fucked up house that you've got and you keep trying to patch it up instead of just knocking the fucking thing down and building something better. So my whole thing is like, get there, build a great future, build something for you and then now figure out how to be yourself in that process because all of those things that happen in the past tend to be lessons and learnings that make you who you are. And we've all got a past. Like for me, I would say that my highest value of learning and teaching was because I was put into special classes with teachers that didn't care. Maybe that's part of the reason. My second highest value of connection, because I was a kid that was maybe alone all school holidays and painting fucking model airplanes because I didn't have any friends. I probably still don't have a lot of friends after this podcast. But, um, (laughs) you know, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that our voids, our missing, our sense of missingness creates our values. And those things are the things that help drive us in life. So instead of looking at them as being a mistake or something that's fucked us up, maybe they're the things that's the actual gift. If we use it as a gift, then we can drive forward to something better. Yeah, a lot stronger. And you've experienced it. 100%. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong, but- I love it. It's great. I'm, I'm, 
I'm there. Instagram questions have gone oh, through. Go on. We'll just do a few. Best way, this is from the old Barry Pona. That's a, it's not even Pony, it's Barry Pona. Best way to adjust the mindset from getting rich quickly to being happy with a 20 year plan. That's Shit, that's very much. specific. Well, fucking oath it is. And it's like it's like it's like Barry could be a he, could be a she. We'll just say transfluid. Um <laughs> We might have to cut that out. <laughs> that's what it is. Um it looks like uh there's a pretty specific question there. Um obviously if you'd got to this far, Barry, and listening, you would have had an answer. Mm-hmm. But um, I will throw it to you. What's the best way to adjust the mindset from getting rich quickly, which is what a lot of people get drummed into their heads, yep. to being happy and fulfilled. Thank you. I uh, added a word to that um, uh, with a 20-year plan. So this is probably going to take me about 30 minutes to answer uh, this okay. question. but <laughs> Sorry, no, Barry, it's... you're going to get the one minute. Okay. Um, look, I always go back to this common principle. Money is the agreed upon exchange of value amongst two or more parties. So when we're looking at money, instead of thinking that money is this thing that, you know, we need to go out and get in order to create this fulfilling life or whatever whatever it is, it's the exchange of value. So where are you most valuable? That's really what it is. I'm most valuable in teaching and learning because my higher value, my highest value in connecting. Could I be Michael Jordan? No, because my values don't determine that. But could someone else do it in a different way? 100% they could. You know, I've got, plenty of clients who make a lot more than a million dollars a year and they all do it in different value structures. Some of them do it by being great in business. Some of them do it great by being great in sport or whatever it is. Normally it's business, but um, your value structure determines your value in society. Now, when we look at the field of study of axiology, which is essentially is value system, it, uh, it, there's two key questions. One of them comes from the field of economics. Where am I the most valuable? Now, yep. I'm the most valuable in teaching and learning yep. and also connecting people. The second question is, where do I feel the most valuable? Now, that's metaphysical. So, you've got two key questions and two key fields of study, economics and metaphysics. First one, where am I the most valuable? So, where do I get paid the most and where am I likely to be paid the most, which is normally related to our value system and where we're going to put the most effort and energy and the most long-term practice. Then the second part is where do I feel the most fulfilled, which is normally our values as well. So you line those two things, that's normally your value structure. So if we're going to build wealth long term, I wouldn't suggest chasing after money because money is just the exchange of value. Those who get rich quick tend to fuck it all anyway. And that's very, very common. Like right now, we're in this beautiful world of this amazing, I, I think it's a bubble, but whether it is or not, I don't know. Only the future will tell. But this amazing time where people are buying essentially JPEGs online for extreme amounts of money for fuck knows what reason. <laughs> Did you buy a JPEG? What have I bought JPEGs for? NFTs. Oh, yeah, fuck. <laughs> so. <laughs> and you've yeah. got to ask a question I've like- got Dave, I've got NFTs for sure. But the question is like, what's the what value the in those things? It's not a fuckload of money though. There you go. <laughs> like, it's not a fuckload of money. When it, when it comes to those pixel punks Dude, things, those yeah, but I didn't buy pixel punks. Hey, let's get it right. And I also, I also, I also in 2017 got Bitcoin, got crypto. So it's just having a dabble. But we've we've got to ask ourselves though, and this is what I always come back to: what's the actual value? And I don't think there's a clear understanding of what that value is at the moment in cryptocurrency. Yeah. So, you know, we know that property, people need houses, that's valuable to somebody. We also know that the share market is essentially businesses and those businesses tend to provide value to people if they're a good business. So- Oh, I could blow that up. Why's that? Depending on who owns the share and what they're owning that share for. Of of course. Like, is it like a BlackRock or a Vanguard, which technically own- let's say 9% of the whole world's wealth, which doesn't matter if the share market goes up or down. They own every Pfizer, AstraZeneca, like they own everything. So- Well, that's what I buy. <laughs> so so I, I tend to buy that. I tend course, to just buy those things. Of course you've got to buy those things mm. because that is what's controlling the monetary system right now. I agree. So for me, it's about having a bit of anything. So yeah. yeah. So and I had to But say. you also have to understand those risk strategies as well. Like- 
could you make money off of NFTs at the moment? Hell yeah. Could you make money off of cryptocurrency? Fucking A. But that's because you can make money off of anything. The question is, is it going to be something that's long term or is it going to be something that's short term because there's stupidity that's happening in the market? And where there's stupid people, there's always going to be stupid things that happen. I don't know that that is essentially a good long term strategy, but could you make money off of it? Hell yeah. And you see that happen just on that. You see that happening like the government says we're going to do fucking insulation on houses and we're going to jam a ton of money into the economy for people to do that. You're always going to get shonksters. You're going to get shafty people in there. And then you're going to get legitimate people. And I think that whole world of cryptocurrency at the moment has both. You've got legitimate people in there, but I don't uh, necessarily think- But so is business. I agree. But long-term businesses, like Barry's asking about sustainable business and long-term, or sorry, long-term wealth strategy. In a long-term wealth strategy, you've got to ask a question, what's actually the value? Because that's going to be the thing that determines whether it goes up or whether it goes down. In your business, you provide an amazing value to society, which is why you've got the business that you have. Could you make money quicker doing something else? Potentially. Yeah. But the question then becomes, is the value there long term? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know if that answers uh, the question. Well, that's okay. That's, and the what, Barry will be happy. What I would also say as well is you've got to understand the lifestyle that you're trying to create. I personally don't don't buy property apart from the house that I live in because for me, it's not a strategy that works for the lifestyle that I want to create. So think about the lifestyle that you want and then think yep. about the strategy. So you don't need, you, you need general cash flow now, not capital tied up. Well, I just invest in shares because I'd rather put my money into something that is long term. Yeah, not in property. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many cases for and against. And that's fair enough because yeah. th that's what makes the world so interesting is that I'm like, oh, I think you need a bit of everything. Yeah. That's that's the way I look at it. But then I'm like, just recently, I'm like, fuck, I'm sick of all the properties I've got. Like, yeah. boring. Like, it gives me nothing. Like, absolutely nothing. It sits there, some rent comes in. It's numbers on a bank account. And to That's me- That's all money is these days. But it's nothing that excites me. Get me something I can drive. A long-term investment on a 1983 Ferrari Testarossa or, you know, something now that- Now you're talking my language. That, something that gives me way more fulfillment than, than, than a number in an account. You gotta be careful though, cause here's what I found stuffs up people's wealth. <laughs> and this is from working with, ex from everyone from extremely broke people to extremely wealthy people. And we're talking people, you know, over a billion dollar plus um, and everybody in between. Now, when we're talking excitement, excitement and money don't go together. So excitement and fulfillment, different uh, story. Sometimes they do like, you know, I, not in I, investing. Uh, not in investing. Okay. Not in investing. Right. You can okay. make money okay. doing exciting shit, but no, not in I'll, investing. I'll, I'll let you off then. Thank you. Because uh, <laughs> yeah, just okay. to clarify, not investing. Yep, spent a fuckload of money. Was fucking excited. And it was fucking awesome, but it wasn't investing. Yeah, but, but you ended up with negative. <laughs> you know, you were down after that. Yeah, I give you. Just that. remember, what goes up has to come back down. So, like, I have friends of mine who trade the markets, and they get excited when things are going up, and then they get all depressed as shit when things go down. That's not really a great strategy for life. I like to know that on average, the US share market goes up by about 8% per year on average over the last 100, 100 and whatever years. Now you can fucking fact check it or whatever. It's probably like 8.2%. Someone's going to get like butt hurt on it or whatever, but it's around about 8%. I'll give you a stat. Go ahead. I'm just going to keep eating these fruit chocks the, on. The, uh, I'll give you a stat. The top six American tech stocks in the last three months went up 32%. Yeah, I know that stat because I invested in the top six as a bit of a play, and I was like, "Fuck me!" You know what the worst performing ones were? Tesla and Amazon, and why? Because they're sending shit to space. So obviously, space is expensive, but they bought it down. So I went. So the average between Microsoft, Facebook, uh, Tesla, Amazon, and Apple was thirty two percent. So. You're fucking happy with the 32%. In fact, more than happy. It's ridiculous. So anyone's come up to me and goes, oh, what would you do? And I said, hmm. it, it depends on how much you've got, but buy what you can. In Because how's tech getting crushed? Like, how's Amazon going to get touched? 
Yeah. How's Apple going to get touched? Well, they might. If Go on. Well, well how? We'll, Tell them this is curious because how is Apple going to get fucking touched? What, there's going to be a new fucking Pear phone coming out? Like, <laughs> Samsung's just garbage. Like, all these Android freaks out there. Like, it, it, I don't see how they're going to get touched. Like, no one is going to introduce a phone, not not in my, uh, what, what year is this, 2021? No one's going to come in and take that place because yeah, I but think they might the do what they did adapt. with Microsoft and then just split the company up and say you can't. And same as what they did with the oil companies. Yeah, and I, and I I'm happy to flow with that. I think mm. the digital guys, you know, Amazon make all their money off software. I mean, mm. it's an amazing model. Microsoft, who would have thought? Apple, who would have thought? Tesla, like yeah. Tesla's going to come under some fire because. There's a lot of many every every manufacturer now. Well, now we've got a shortage of fucking microchips. So every manufacturer now is coming out with an electric car, mm. and that's what Elon Musk wanted. Funny enough, the guy must be a freak. I, fuck, that's one person I'd love to meet. But, Same. Uh, it, it it's crazy to think that here's all the IP for electric. Go do it yourselves, and that's what happened. Yeah. So we're in for some interesting times. So for me, you know that that. Investing in a bit of everything is probably my 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 tip. But anyway, that question is up to me. Another I, question. Well, I think that's a great a great strategy as well. It all just depends. Like some people just love property, but they're I've got some of my clients who are amazing at property and make fucking tons of money in property. Yeah. But when it comes to shares, they're absolute dog shit, and I don't know why, because they run a property business or a uh, you know property development business. But they just can't seem to get it right with shares. Yeah. Some people are amazing at crypto, but they're just they don't seem to do well Pull in out other at the right time. Or- yep. It, yeah. I think it, you just need to figure out what works for you. I don't. I personally don't like property because I don't. I don't like the management. I don't like having to pay for, you know, all the shit that goes wrong in them and updating the kitchens and the bathrooms. And I can't be fucked. I just want to buy something that I know like the top businesses in America are probably going to be the top businesses for a while. So I invest in them. And fair enough. So. So I've got another question here. Sourced low and slow. Ooh. <clears throat> How do you manage all the noise to clearly hear your direction? It's a great question. Fuck it, that is a good question. Yeah, I like that. These guys are trying to get into our store, by the way. Sourced low and slow. Unfortunately, we just put in another another brand, but that's another. Oh, no, it's not okay, devastated. Was, <laughs> You've it, just it ruined was, it for them. No, it's not to say they ha- they can't. It's just that's how it is. Well. The more you know yourself, the easier it is to listen to yourself. The less you know of yourself, the harder it is to hear yourself. And I think I, from what I've seen of working with tens of thousands of people is that every person that I've met who says, I know who I am, that I actually don't know who they are. And no one really knows who they are because we have these implanted values. There's something just as a bit of a freak out in philosophical construct. There's an idea called noospheres and noospheres are a sphere of influence that we consistently grow through if you're growth driven. Now, every every sphere that you grow through has a subordination to a, another group of people. So you might at first subordinate to your mother and your father or so you try to keep them happy, but then you break out of that sphere, but then it might be teachers. Then you break out of that sphere, then it's society. So then you break out of that sphere and, and you keep going, but there's always someone who you look up to and there's other people who look down upon you and you get stuck in that area when you're or in that newosphere as you grow. When you're a leader, you have to have bust, you have to br- have broken out of a lot of newospheres in order to be a leader because then you don't really lead. And even now it's hard to find leaders. Most people aren't leaders because they're afraid of what everybody else thinks. Yeah. I go into the business world and it, it fucking sucks because I get part of my French, but I get asked to go on podcasts and shit and, and I get sat down and you can't swear, you can't do this, don't talk about this. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> I can't. Not here. Yeah, I know. That's why it's great. I've been eating fruit chocks and drinking wine and sparkling water and burping and it's fantastic. But this is the way it should be. Like, we're all people trying to navigate life. And unfortunately, we've got this almost super clean corporate world who doesn't want anyone to say anything because now someone's going to get offended. And I wrote a post on my social media about this the other day that the more that you adjust to try to suit other people's mental and emotional instabilities, which is essentially what they are or their wounds, not only is it bad for them, but it's bad for society as a whole. Like if if I if someone said to me, you know, I don't like blue jackets because they make you look fucking stupid. Well, how I deal with that is how I deal with it. 
Now, if I can't deal with it, I can try and change 8 billion people to all like blue jackets. Or I can just get on with my life and realize it's not that bad and try to figure out what the benefit is to me and then move forward. And then buy a green one. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, but it just like our society at the moment is in this just almost, I don't know, it's crazy. There's polarities on both sides. And you've got stuff like TikTok where people almost seem to be feral and ungoverned. And then you've also got this world where people are so governed where you can't say anything. You know, the media is hyper hypersensitive to any sort of criticism or anything unless you're a- Cancel culture. It, it is a cancel culture. But if you're a white male, it's completely, the rules don't apply. But outside of that, the rules, oh. you know, there's, there's these rules. And I think that it, it just makes people weak and it makes people vulnerable. I don't think the best thing is forcing everybody else to change to make people stop being reactive. They're reactive for a reason and wounded individuals are always going to react. You know, if you rub my arm and I don't feel anything, it feels good. But if you put a big gaping wound there and you touch it, it fucking hurts. Now, you can rub a feather over it and it's going to sting like shit, especially if there's pus coming out of it and it's going to hurt. So the more wounded an individual, the more reactive they're going to be. Now, our whole society is adapting to these wounded individuals who haven't learned how to move beyond whatever hurt them in the past. I don't think that it's a great strategy for the strength of a country or even just people in general. So I don't even know how we got onto that. And no, it's, uh, it's but great. Hey, it's, I, it's, it's, I, it's, uh, that, we got onto that by the question was something about being yeah, yourself. How do you, how, how do you, yeah, how do you manage <laughs> all the noise? I mean, we we say it internally all the time. I mean, we're just saying what we believe is what you know everyone's thinking. Yeah, and I think you've actually done an amazing job. I think, um, and not to fucking fluffy pillows or anything, but <laughs> you've done an amazing job. <laughs> This is what happens when I'm like, <laughs> fluffy pillows. That's such a good say. I love it. I've never heard it. I just came up with it then. I love it. Done. Just love if you're going to quote it, just you know, put Michael Mojo underneath it. <laughs> don't, don't do like. <laughs> don't don't do, don't do like most fuckers do on social media and just steal my quote cards and shit and just cut my name off the bottom. <laughs> just screenshot it and cut it off. <laughs> but anyway. Um, <laughs> So, but I think you've done a great job because you're someone who has seen an opportunity in the market as well to be yourself and get out there and say, you know, people who still ship from our stores, this isn't acceptable, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna put your fucking face and your name on social media. Don't okay. do this shit. I think that that's a great thing for society as a whole. Like back in the day, there were consequences. These days, there's no consequences. None. Zero. The only consequence is if you speak out about it, then you're the problem. Yeah, which we, is stupid. And uh, we've had to navigate certain kinds of media trying to angle certain angles hmm. um throwing mental health uh you know how about their mental health uh, like hang on that happened in the past and you got the shit kicked out of you well, yeah that was that was the mental health adjuster yeah and and you know we're just saying it as as it is and hmm. the reality is 99 percent of people agree like hmm. like i say to them so if someone walks into your house and takes whatever they want it's fine and it's like no it's not like mm. it's not fine if some there there's many organizations to help people deal with you know the unfortunate of not being able to put food on your pl plate but mm. i'm not talking about one off offenders we are talking about people specifically that are multiple and it's a pain mm. and everyone's on edge and you know we can't do things anymore all right we we better keep moving uh what is your morning routine Shit, I get asked this all the time. Well, okay. um, my morning routine is whatever I feel like. Okay, I yeah. fucking love it. That sounds because, like me. Well, because I think like there's this whole morning routine thing in our industry as well where it's like- Have you seen any of my daily morning routine clips? I haven't. <laughs> there's this whole thing of like get you up- You would laugh. Are they good? Speedos? Uh, no, nah, they're whatever. Yeah, they're exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I, there's this whole culture of like in our industry of like this morning routine, got to get up at- Four o'clock. The yep, truth then is have that your coffee, then oh, go to the gym for twenty-two minutes. It's 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 crazy. Like, in in all honesty, the clearer you are with your values, the clearer you are at setting morning routine. If you've got a high value on kids, probably spending time with your family is going to be important to you in the morning. Yeah. Mine, I've got a high value on exercise, also and a high value of study. So I'm going to probably study in the morning. And like I did this morning, I did a little bit of study this morning before I did anything, and then I trained. I've got a gym at home, so I trained. And then after that, whatever happened throughout the day happened throughout the day. So, look, set your life up 
as however you feel the best to start your day. My morning routine is normally get up, have a shower, and then whatever happens, happens. Okay. Within my values. Okay. Um, with a drag race with a McLaren and your R8. Yeah. What would win? Oh, the McLaren chews it away. Like, it's not even close. They're two completely different cars, though. One's 2011, the other's 2018, 19. It just, they're just completely different cars. The McLaren is an absolute pleasure to drive, apart from it being so low. It's just fucking stupid, but it looks cool. Um, <laughs> and the R8 is just grunty. It's almost like asking going from an R8 to a HQ Holden. Like, you can put a, a stroked engine in it and it will be quick, but it's still not the same as driving an R8. They're just, they're different cars. I love them both, though. Yeah. Oh, uh, they like my actually, children. Actually, V actually go a lot. You could hear a car and V goes, oh, is that a McLaren? I went, no, nah, that's not a McLaren. And I was like, oh, and then you knew. She's, she's like, oh, that could be an R8. And I went, fuck, it was quite loud. It's very loud. Yeah. All my cars are all stupid, like... Do you know, but I sold <laughs> I sold all my cars and said I'd never buy another car unless it was a car that I loved. And so I used to drive to meetings with like clients of mine who were multimillionaires. Some of them were, you know, topping on hundreds of millions. I would go to these meetings and I'd park my wife's little blue Hyundai Gets in the cheap shit suit because it was the only thing I could afford next to like the Ferraris and Lambos because I refused to buy a car unless it was a car that I loved. When I saw the R8, I knew that that was my car and I still can't sell it. Yeah, it looks cool. What, yeah. are you trying to sell the R8? No, I'm not trying to sell it. Uh, I'd rather sell the McLaren than the R8. McLaren's less practical. Come on. What what McLaren is that, by the way? 720S. Okay, nice car. Yeah. But it's just, I, I don't know. It's that well, whole mate, nostalgia it's, it's of like, like the one first car. centimetre off the ground. Yeah. It's the nostalgia of the first car. Like, I always regret selling my first car, which was my Datsun Bluebird, and I'm still looking for it. If, so, if anyone knows... Uh, I think the number plates were UFX 139. If you've got it, I'll buy it. Just tell me <laughs> tell me where it is, <laughs> okay? But yeah, I just can't sell because that supercar was like my whole life's work to buy my first supercar. Once I got it, now that's just my my thing. Don't you find it with the LFA as well? Okay. Well, I, I did change the question. The question was from Kinder Surprise. Which I know too well. Little. You didn't even answer my question about your cars. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> the, dra the question was, who would win in a drag race between oh. the McLaren and the LFA? Whoa. Okay. Easy. This, it, the McLaren. The would McLaren. It? Yeah, it's ridiculously fast. The LFA was born in 2012, so it's still... It's so it's like, around the same year as the R8. Yeah, but well, they were an absolute beast of a car correct. in that era, though. And, and off the line, it's not that quick anymore, but geez, that... The McLaren is just, it's ridiculous. The McLaren like, is super stupid That quick. is one of the most amazing cars that I've ever driven. And um, I'm like, damn, that's hard to believe that that's legal to drive. Yeah. And it's dangerous. Like, I, I can't believe anyone that has money can just go buy one of those and then cruise around on the streets. They are lightning fast. They stick to the road through the hills. They're amazing. And they're scary. They're definitely there. Like for, for someone that likes going fast, they're a game changer. They're an incredible car. Like the technology in them is just phenomenal. They hold the road really well. Like I remember one day just I was out in the McLaren and, you know, just cruising around or whatever. And then I got home and I thought I'll take out the R8. And then just coming around a corner, you give it to the R8 and it's, you know, it's grunty and it's beefy and... But it just, even though it's full drive, it starts to lose traction and get a little bit stupid, whereas the McLaren doesn't do that. It just holds and it goes. They're just, they're different. Yeah, I've got plenty of stories about the McLaren, about, uh, like I, I had one for the week, they gave it to me at Zagami. And no plug for Zagami, but that it was... They're good there. It, it, they're amazing. Yeah. And and they said, take this, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, fuck. I went through the hills. I rang up my mate. He was working. He was working in Elizabeth somewhere. I said, dude, you got to, you actually got, we used to drive through the hills together in our WRXs. And I said, mate, you got to do this. This is incredible. So I drove, picked him up, picked him up from Elizabeth, went through the hills and I, I had to get back. I said, this has got to be four wheel drive because it didn't squiggle, didn't squirm, was just on point the whole time. They do feel like that. And 
it wasn't. It was rear-wheel drive. Mm. And you've got to look at the pe- pedigree of McLaren. Mm. McLaren is a race car trying to put it on the road. Ferrari, Lamborghini are road cars trying to turn them into race cars. And the McLaren is so far ahead. Like, I'm sorry for all the Lamborghini, (laughs) Ferrari people out there, but it is so far ahead in the way it drives. And real sports cars, you need a McLaren. I think it's – I wasn't expecting it. Like, I'd never driven it. I bought my R8 sight unseen. I just saw it, rang up the guy. <coughs> he loved the car. It, it's still never been driven in the rain or on dirt, by the way. Ah, so, cool. yeah, it's just, it's immaculate. Anyway, I sent a mate to go check it out. And then when I got it, it was the first time I've ever driven a supercar. It was freaky. And then when I bought the McLaren again, I just rang up the guy, had a chat, done, let's do it, made it happen. And then when I got it, I just, the first drive was like, what the fuck? It is just. I was expecting it to be like a step up from the R8. It wasn't. It was like oh, it's 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 like, a completely different car. It's like going into the Millennial Falcon or whatever it is. Like it's it's bonkers. Yeah. I, I it, <laughs> yeah, I I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely spellbound. Mm. Um, good on McLaren. Fuck, beautiful car. Yeah, sick car. So excited. Mm. All right, fuck. So I'll, I'll show you the keys one day and we'll go out for a drive. <laughs> um, done, you're you're, you're a way better driver than I am, so you can <laughs> <laughs> you can show me what it does. Done, done. So so the answer to who would wear that, it's not a fair drag. The McLaren would flog the LFA. I don't know what sounds better, though, because I reckon oh, the LFA is... Okay, that's, that's easy. Yeah. That's easy. Let me... I'll just dispel that in about five seconds. Or it'll be four I think seconds. it's the best sounding car of, I think I've heard. Yeah. So this will be a four it, second. It, unless it's one of those old like V12 screamers. Yeah, here you go. You might do it. see if you can hear this. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it gets my nipples hard. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that, that sounds- See, I'm like the, the inappropriate mental performance coach. <laughs> like- People are like, why should I come work with you? And I'm like, all right, first of all, you probably don't want to. I'm inappropriate. I'll hold you accountable and I don't take shit from anyone. So, do you really want to work with me? No, they're good. They're all things that the society is lacking. Right I agree. Now. So, we have some hard-hitting questions. And as you can tell, <laughs> the rest, the whole podcast has been quite freeform. But these ones here, we tried to wrap in something. So, you know, I thought one day maybe we could go back and grab these answers from the amazing people and yourself that are that are behind you on the wall. But question number one, if you weren't doing what you're doing right now, what would you be doing? I don't know. Pro- I'd probably be in jail. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, no, probably personal training or something like that. Like I, I always loved, I did love being a personal trainer. It's just I realized that when I was working in the medical center, everybody knows what to do. They just don't fucking do it. So yeah. I was like, why? And it, it came down to what happens in their head. So that I, I realized that the missing link that most people have is their mindset. And that's also the reason why I got into nutrition because I realized that a person's ability to perform well in the gym and to also recover from whatever physical injury they have is based on the way that they eat. So it was sort of like a natural progression to try to find what's the best way of helping someone live a great life. I don't know, probably personal training. Personal training, fitness. Okay. Yeah, that's mm. fine. It's up to totally your answer, that one. Um, Drugs, weapons, I don't know. Yeah, all Outside of, the, of that, like, all, all of the above. who knows? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what? We what? can cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's amazing we had a whole range of answers on that so what do you wish that you had known when you first started out that you now know what and what advice could you give to someone that's a 16 year old or a 16 year old or 18 year old wanting to be you know training people on what you do what piece of advice could you give them? The same as the greatest thinkers in history. Know thyself, be thyself. That simple. Don't try to copy everyone else. Just do your thing. Like, my purpose in life is to help people perform better. I'm not here to make people feel happy. I'm help. I'm here to help people perform. And I, I found that once I made that clear distinction, 
just it's just the way that I live. Yeah. Yeah. I actually love that. That's mm. great. By the way, that's what that's what the mystics call a purpose. So once you're clear with your purpose, it makes life really easy, just because you know who you are. And I think, I you know, obviously speaking to you, I've sort of picked up that it's go back, and really focus on who you are. Mm. Yeah. Do you think you need to be able to, you know, work on like focus on your strengths as like that's what you should try and excel at or do you think you should try to be well-rounded what is well-rounded oh someone that's good at everything who's that i've never met him i've never seen him and i've worked with tens of thousands of people most people to be honest i tell people this in my events and i say look here, here's the truth i'm shit at 99 percent of everything i've just found the one percent of thing that i'm the one percent of things that i'm good at which is human behavior and i love helping people perform better so should you want to learn from someone who's great at that? Come and learn from me. If you want me to walk across water or be the best fucking family member that I can be, I'm probably not that person. That's who I am. And I tell people in my events, like, of these are my values. This here is what I value in life. If you don't agree with that, I get it. But you're probably not the person who wants to be educated from me. And I get it. That's fine. You know, I tell people that I catch up with my family once a month because it's that's to me that's satiating, like, I spend half a day with my family and I'm, I'm completely fine for another month. I don't need more time with them. But what I do know is that there's a lot of people out there who feel guilty that they don't spend enough time with their family and then they spend time with their family and they're not fucking present anyway. They're all caught up in their head thinking about work, thinking about all the other things that they want to be doing instead of being with their family. I just teach people to be themselves and be honest with themselves because that's how you're going to live a great life. If you're doing things and you're not present consistently because you're thinking about other shit, that's because you're unclear on what you really want to do. And sometimes being honest with other people makes you seem like a prick to them, but it's the greatest thing that you ever do for yourself. And people understand that. Yeah. You no, know, just on that topic, my mum, her highest value is family. And so she used to say to me, you know, you never come and see us. You never catch up with us. You don't care about us. And she'd use these guilt tactics to try to get me to live in her values. Because to her, family is the most fulfilling thing. So she believed that how could I be fulfilled if, I'm not living what's fulfilling to her. And that's how society operates, right? We project our values onto others because it's important to us. I see business people that go, everyone should run a fucking business. No, they shouldn't. 99% of people should never start a business. You know, you should work hard. Not everyone wants to work hard, so they shouldn't do that. So I, I sat down with my mom one day and I said, what do you really want from me? And she said, I want you to be happy. Now, it's not the terminology that I'd use, but that's, I get it. And I said, what do you think makes me happy? And she said, traveling and teaching and doing what you're doing. And I said, so would you want me to give that up? And she started crying and she said, no, all I've ever wanted is for you to be happy. And I said, can you see that I am? My mum has never made me feel guilty about my life choices after that because she sees that I'm doing, I've achieved more than most people on this planet. And that is doing something that I love to wake up for every day. When I get out of bed in the morning, I'm not thinking about all the shit that I have to do. I'm thinking about, the shit that I would love to do, which is educate people and, and to do something great. I'm, I'm here with you today, not because I have to be, but because I want to be. Yeah. And and for me, that's something that's amazing. And I hope I can pass that on to others. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't even know if that answers whatever the question was, but yeah. What piece of advice? Yeah, just be yourself. Yeah. Know yourself, be yourself. So you can't, you can't be yourself without knowing yourself first. That's what I excel at. That's what my events are. That's <clears throat> That's what I do. If there was one thing that you could do that would have an impact on the world, what would it be? It can be Fuck, anything. That's deep. That this is it is deep, but we've had some very shallow answers. <laughs> <laughs> um shit. <laughs> Well, like we've had world peace and nah. blah, blah, blah. So well, it's I up can, to you. I'm I not, can debunk uh, that shit straight I'm, away. I'm, 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 fuck. I'm happy to take anything. If there's one thing that you could do that would have an impact on the world, what would it be? Do you know what? I just, I, I would love to just keep doing what I'm doing. And I mean, my big goal is to be into the US and into Europe and all that sort of stuff. I want to have the biggest human performance institute globally and have the best thought leaders on the planet who challenge the norm i want to be i want to be debated with my thoughts and my ideas and and us to come to conclusions of 
how we can help people to understand themselves better by using the greatest philosophers and the greatest scientists on the planet. Not, you know, I don't want to sit there and repeat all the same shit that everyone else does about positive thinking and world peace. Like, mate, you can't even be fucking peaceful in your own house with the people that you love. How are you going to do that in front of 8 billion people on the planet, right? <laughs> it, it's true. I say this in my events. Like, it's the most stupidest thing that people wish for. You know, peace comes with war and war comes with peace. Like, it's a, it's a consistent progression and evolution of how humans understand each other. And, you know, you have family war consistently in order to find peace, to move forward, to understand each other. And that's what we do with peace and war. It's a, it's a progression. So you can't have one without the other. But anyway, um, yeah, I just... Well, you've said it. I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And just do it in a bigger way. And, and I want to help the people that influence others more than anyone. Like, really, I think my place is probably Hollywood and in the music industry... Because I something that I love is music and I can watch someone get up on stage and alter people's way of thinking and their states in a matter of seconds and it can be tens of thousands of people just by the way that they perform, but who's fucking looking after them? And okay. I remember watching the Katy Perry documentary and seeing her bawling because her marriage had fallen apart and she's on a plane and she's got to go and perform. Who's looking after her? And I think in our society, we have this thing of like looking after the bottom you know, the bottom 10% or the bottom 20% and this need to want to support those people, um, maybe because of our own guilt or our own insecurities, but who's looking after the top 1% to 10%? Because as a kid, if it wasn't for those 1% to 10%, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. I looked at someone else driving a Ferrari and I went, I want to be that guy. And everyone else said, Mike, you got to be rich to do that. And I went, well, why can't I be rich? And they went, because you're fucking a dumb shit. And I went, okay, that doesn't make sense to me, but... I'll be rich one day. If it wasn't for those people who perform at their best, we wouldn't have the inspiration to want to be better. And I think no one looks after them. They're the people I want to look after. Okay. Now, we have one more question. This is hard hitting. Mm -hmm. This stumps a lot of people. Ooh. If you died... <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm dying. <laughs> if you died and came back as a board game, what board game would best describe your life? Fuck. What's the most confusing one? <laughs> so I can tell you some. <laughs> like we've had Yahtzee, we've had Snakes and Ladders. Um, do you want to know mine? It's Twister, isn't it? Nah. Is it new Twister? Nah. Nah, I don't mind Twister. <laughs> I don't mind Twister, though. I wouldn't ruin it with a new part, but I've, um, mine's um, Scrabble. Okay. Like, sometimes I come up with some good words, sometimes I come up with some bad words, and some of those are worth a lot, and some of those are worth not so much. So, Scrabble, I reckon, best describes what I do, because... I talk how I'm feeling at the time and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad, but it's always good to s say how you feel at the time. Yeah. And I don't shy away from that. Albeit sometimes some people think it's a little bit could get in trouble. Um, I'm not afraid to speak what's on my mind and that's, that's my, that's my one. Um, I've had snakes and ladders a few times. You know, some people are saying plenty of life's ups or downs. <clears throat> it's had some crazy ones. What was it? We've had some games that are out of... Yeah, we've had the game Risk. Um, I've had, I think we've had a Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> one of my, one of my um, friends is Shane Yen. Have you, <clears throat> you know Shane? Yeah, yep. Hollywood. Yep. So um, Shane Yen's just come out with a board game called Who's the C-Bomb? And... Uh, I think that would probably be, that would probably definitely suit my, you know, most people's opinions of me, but... Um, so, like, there's a game called Who's a Cunt? Yes. <laughs> no shit. Yeah, he told us, so I've got a business mastermind um, that, we, that we run, and um, Shane came and spoke, uh, or he live streamed in um, during COVID, and he was telling us about, I was just chatting to him about... Um, almost in a similar style to this and just like, you know, how he comes up with his creative ideas and how he figures stuff out. 
And he said, I was just in the bookstore and I realized that there's all these books that have the word fuck in them. And that used to be a taboo word. And he was like, I wonder what the next taboo word's going to be. <laughs> and obviously it was the C-bomb. And um, he's like, I wonder how I can piece that together with board games because that's his his thing, right? You know, he came up with Battle of the Sexes and, he, um, you know, Wheel of Fortune. I think a lot of those board games are, are his brand. Um, or he yeah, they are. Yeah, he's definitely licensed a lot of lot of games. Yeah, he's okay. an amazing at licensing. And so, so he came up with that. And then he rang up the company and said, look, I want to license the Guess Who board game. And they turned the Guess Who board game into Who's a C-Bomb. And that's, there you that's go. now selling all around the world. Okay. Well, there I'm you have it. I'm buying it for a lot of my friends at oh. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll just think of you. I know. I, I want to put my photo in there somewhere for them. <laughs> Well, he's a very smart guy. Very, nah, very well, you know, one of the one of the few people that was in Hollywood asked who owns the Hollywood sign. <laughs> Everyone said no one. So he went and fucking bought the land. Mm. And uh, <laughs> who the fuck thinks of this shit? He's he's a. I'm thinking of putting one of those signs in Beaumont, but that would cost <laughs> a lot. So I might just go find it in Sky. <laughs> a lot cheaper. <laughs> I reckon oh. people take photos of it. I, I reckon it would be. Oh, I reckon it's a thing. A Don't laugh. Who else has got a Hollywood sign in the world? No Didn't one. They, I thought they thought about doing that here no. in Adelaide. They were going to do like Adelaide. Adelaide. The hills. Well, I'll do Adelaide and then I'll, I'll license it. Knowing Adelaide, though, what will happen is it'll be half done and then they'll like, uh, we'll just skip through it quickly and nah, some will fall down and no lights. Someone will, will say, you can't do that. It's not good for the environment. It needs to be made out of the air. It's. There's a whole lot of Holy reasons why not. you get blown over in the winds. <laughs> oh. Oh, Adelaide. All, all jokes aside, we should do it. They put shit Adelaide on there. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you can't do that. It's got to be like Adelaide. Adelaide's great. I love living here. It's just that it's so fucking hard to do anything. ADL is ADL, so when they're flying over, ADL, okay, we're here. It's Adelaide. <laughs> it's official. Um, What was that? What? You just said to I've. I've you just said something about, oh, I love living in Adelaide. Hey, hey, hence why I do. Here. I love living in Adelaide, but just anything that seems to happen in Adelaide just seems to just take for <laughs> fucking ever. Just there's so much red tape. I mean, I've got plenty of friends that I've worked with and, and people that I've worked with who are private clients of mine who are doing extremely well and want to push the boundaries in business. Just everything's fucking red tape. And it's extremely hard to try and do anything here in Adelaide. It's not a, unfortunately, it's not a progressive town. It's a comfortable town. Yeah, I think it's getting better. It is. Um, you know, and trying to get things rocking and rolling, Lot 14, space projects, lot landing pads that we, we, you know, have just been approved at Port Lincoln. I'm excited for what's to come because the last thing I want to see is my girls grow up and they have to go somewhere else to earn a living. I agree. And to me, we need to be making sure that this is the place that, if you want to, well, we've proven over COVID, it's a perfect place to be able to get shit sorted to an extent. Mm. But the red tape, the government bureaucracy, bureaucracy is a joke. It needs to be sorted out so we can, you know, really Councils. strive and move ahead. Yeah. And that is the crucial part of us having a say, saying this and making people realise this is a great, this is you know, short of one of the best places on the planet to live. We I have agree. the best produce, the best, you know, the best of every food source <clears throat> is here. And I, it's a special place and it's great, you know, that we're here. We're talking to other successful South Australians. And for me, it's really about making people realise that this is the place to come. And I think over COVID, we've, we've had a million expats move back to Australia. Yeah. We've had a shitload move back. Yes, that's put pressure on the housing prices and we can't buy cars and blah, blah, blah. But there's a whole lot of other effects to that. It's it's about what's exciting to mm. come. And being in SA, it is very exciting. You obviously are on the frontier of motivating people and getting people to be able to be the best that they can be by learning who they are. And... I've learnt that today and it's been fascinating having you coming in and hearing your story. I hadn't spoken to you before other than, you know, got our research done, spoken to many people about you and it seems to be the same thing. You know, concentrate on yourself and, yeah, it's actually changed the way that I thought about you, to be honest, and 
I'm excited to see uh, what comes about. You said we haven't even started talking about half the things you put nah, out. not even close. <laughs> so, you know, it's just a bit of a taster. So there may be a part two coming forward in the future, but I appreciate I mean, you coming on board. You didn't know what you're getting yourself into. Thank you very much for coming on board. And my thank pleasure. You. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thanks thank for you. the fruit shocks. No, done. <laughs>